Good evening. I'm going to call to order the Airport Master Plan Advisory Committee uh, meeting for June 6th here at 5.30. So we'll get uh, started. And uh, the first item on the uh, agenda is the election of a uh, permanent chair. So I need to uh, ask, is there any nominations for the permanent chair? Right behind you. Right behind you. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I would like to move to nominate um, Cynthia Richson. Okay. She has had enormous experience as a chairperson, as the town chair of the town of Middleton. She was also on the plan commission, and she's advised boards as well. So she's got a pretty good command of, of <coughs> what's what in this state. I Very second good. that. Thank you. Second it. Okay. I'd like to nominate Leaf. Okay. He's been involved in the city for many, many years in many, many different capacities and held similar type positions. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second, okay. Are there any other nominations? And I'll ask one more time, are there any other additional nominations? Okay, hearing none, we'll close the nominations. Um, Yep, we'll do a show of hands. Thank you, Mark. Um, so let's, uh, since Cynthia was nominated uh, first, let's take a show of hands for uh, Cynthia. One, two, three. Okay. And a show of hands for relief. Okay. All right. Hmm. All right. Uh, it looks like I'll be your chair. So. Um, but I appreciate everybody's, everybody's efforts uh, there. Um, so we'll, we'll just move on to the next. Uh, oh, we need, yes. Thank you, Mark. Hello. We need to uh, nominate a vice chair. And so I'll open the nominations for vice chair. Any I nominate uh, Cindy. Second. Okay. Any other nominations for vice chair? Yeah, I'll ask a third time. Any other, any additional nominations for vice chair? Hearing none. Cynthia, I think you're, well, we'll vote on it. Uh, all those in favor of the nomination, uh, signal, uh, give a show of hands. Okay, all right. Cynthia, you are the vice chair. Congratulations to you as well. And, and you as well. Um, all right. Do you want Cindy to come up here? Do you hear people? Are the mics on? The mics yeah. are on. Yeah. Okay. I heard someone say the mics are on. I heard. Do you leave? Leave. Okay. Do you want Cindy to come up here? Um. Yeah. That'd be. Switch them. Yeah. Why don't you guys switch? She's a sweetheart. Appreciate it. Yeah. 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 They're just switching. All right. We can we, let's let's review the agenda since everybody probably doesn't doesn't have one. So yeah, Greg, if you want to just go through that quickly. Thank you. I want to thank all the advisory committee members for uh, continued participation and really appreciate your effort. We know this is a time commitment and uh, appreciate your feedback and continue to be a sounding board as we as we work through the master plan process. Um, number of the agenda items tonight, um, you know, there's some administrative things, the uh, the electing of the, the chair, the vice chair. Um, we want to go through the, the meeting minutes from the last meeting and, and, and approve those. 
And then um, based on the, the last meeting, I think we can all agree that there was a need to establish some guidelines and ground rules. And, and one of the first things we want to do with this meeting is uh, talk through that and, and give you folks a chance to talk about the process um, to allow us to get through the agenda in, a, in an efficient means, uh, but then also to have an opportunity for the public to, to ask questions. Um, uh, once we get through that, some of that administrative stuff, we want to talk about uh, the community input. Um, one of the things we heard from the, the last meeting was, uh, you know, a, a desire to really raise awareness that this master plan is, is going on. Um, we did have a, a, a public uh, for, uh, op open house workshop, and we want to talk about some of the comments that we received from that. Uh, we also want to talk about comments that we received from the users. Um, going back at the start of this, one of the first things we did was interview the, the existing users and potential users of the airport uh, to try to assess demand and, and the needs and what works and what doesn't. Um, so we want to talk through that. Uh, and then we want to get into a little bit and um, talking about the regulatory environment that the airport sits in. And so even though the airport is a city-owned facility, um, it is beholden to a lot of federal guidelines, and, and Rick Dunkelberg is with us here today. Rick has um, been working at airports for a long time. He's one of our more senior planners, and he's going to talk about some of the, those things to kind of give a framework of what the city can do, what they control, what they can't. Um, we want to spend a little bit of time talking about those things this evening. Um, after that, we want to have a recap of the forecasts that we've done. We talked about that somewhat at the last meeting, but we thought it'd be good to, to go over that again, have a little brief recap. Um, and that's what we want to present tonight. After that, we'd open it up to the public to ask questions on, on what is presented and then talk about where we go from here, what our next steps are. So that's an overview of the agenda and I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Leif. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. Um, anybody have any questions relative to? Go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, I'd actually like to discuss <coughs> item nine next. Uh, I think public input is really important, and I'm really kind of disappointed that it's limited to questions only from the public. Um, I just read the very voluminous advisory circular from the FAA that is cited in the 411 uh, meeting materials from uh, Mead and Hunt, and it talks about how important public involvement is and that you should provide regular forums throughout the study and an opportunity to comment uh, to make it an effective public involvement program. So uh, we can certainly limit with time three minutes, I think is pretty standard, and um, so that we can still accomplish our objective. Mm -hmm. I, I just think leaving it to the end, there's a lot of people with family commitments and other things that some people do pay that. No, I'm open for that if the committee agrees to it but oftentimes a lot of the questions that are asked by the public uh, are answered in so that's that's the risk that uh, I think we have by having it at the beginning but if the committee wants to go ahead I'm fine with it or you I could, just you could do it at the end of the discussion of each major item agenda item and just you know make that's sure. what I was thinking we, yeah, we could do that, and that way it allows us to get through the agenda. Because uh, we do need to I get do through think, the agenda, right? Yeah, I do think limiting, having a limit on the the, uh, the comments will keep us here uh, at a re adjourning at a reasonable hour, um, not having to. Okay. Three minutes. Any per other person comments? Or three minutes per speaker. Per speaker. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, if we go with uh, the idea of after each major topic, and then let's uh, limit that, you know, three minutes a speaker, but let's limit it to maybe four or five speakers, and then we can clean it up at the end as is uh, outlined here because otherwise you know we could get to <laughs> item one and then be off like we did uh, last I, I would time agree with, with quite that. a discussion Maybe 10 so minutes 15 minutes tops for that particular particular segment. topic okay any other well, go ahead rich the people that know that they're going to have to leave early would should have perhaps priority to speak uh, okay. in the interims and then at the end, of course, it'll be open for everyone. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Did everybody agreeable to that? Okay. OK, 
Okay, let's let's move on to our first item or our second item, would be the approval of the April 11th uh, meeting minutes. Any uh, comments, discussion, corrections? Actually, I have a comment. Yep. So uh, when we elected a temporary chair, I did, thanks to Mark Opitz, uh, relook at the statute on that. Uh, and the minutes are supposed to be an accurate reflection of what actually transpired. And a member can always ask to go above the minimum requirement. Mm -hmm. So we did an actual motion and second. Um, actually, am I getting confused with the airport commission minutes? Yes, Maybe I am. All right. Thank you. So, okay. thank you. Uh, I'll move approval. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Rich is going to second. Um, all those in favor of the motion or further discussion, hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Any comments from the public? Okay. We're going to move on to, let's see, meeting uh, format and guidelines. And Mark, you're going to take that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So as, as um, Greg already mentioned, when he provided an overview of the agenda, can you turn a little bit, please? I just turned. Um, we, we felt that at the last meeting, it was important to get public comment, so we went through the um, open house format, which, which yielded significant comments and questions. And... Um, uh, and we were trying to provide some structure working with the temporary chair and with project staff we were trying to provide some structure so that we could have a bit more uh, order to our meeting um, so just as a background the committee here the advisory committee as a reminder was formed to act as a major resource for airport staff and consultants in developing alternatives for study and ultimately recommendations for action as <laughs> is this better sorry about that so the purpose of the advisory committee is to act as a major resource for airport staff and consultants in developing alternatives for study and ultimately recommendations for action as a body the advisory committee will be consulted throughout the study and members views will be carefully considered wherever possible the idea that we are encouraging and, and would like to see is, is for the committee members to reach consensus, but there will be differences of opinion at times we anticipate, and uh, when that happens, minority positions will be fully recognized and documented. Ultimately, the decision-making body is the Middleton Common Council upon recommendation from the Airport Commission. So and to understand that, Mark, then, we, we're really just, we're advisory. Advisory to the uh, uh, airport commission. Uh, airport the, commission. The, right. the commission actually, uh, the airport commission, first discussed creating an advisory committee a year ago, uh, when we were putting together the scope for the master plan for the airport, for with the consultant, the scope of services for the consultant, uh, and incidentally, at that time, we also discussed. Um, a two-tiered survey approach. One was uh, starting with an inventory of users, and then later it would be a community survey. Yep. Um, may I say something? Sure. Sure. So um, I read this, and I heard the words as a major resource for airport staff. So I'm assuming it's persons like yourself. Airport project staff, yeah. And consultants meet and hunt. Right. So I mean, the Common Council is the ultimate decision maker on this. And I don't know that their motion narrowed it to just being uh, informative for you and Mead and Hunt. And I'm reading the December 17, 2018 Airport Commission minutes, which basically says that Mead and Hunt's scope of services identified the creation of an advisory committee to serve as a sounding board for proposed development alternatives and be a conduit for information among various interest groups. And then they referenced the school referendum and spoke about the importance of the public knowing what is going on with a project like this, don't want to undermine the good relationship that the airport currently has with the surrounding community. And so, I mean, I read uh, about we can only uh, speak for themselves, not for the committee or for any other member. I understand not for the committee or for any other member, but speak only for yourself when we're supposed to be a sounding board, sort of a conduit. I, I just feel like that's inconsistent. 
and rather narrow. The idea here is that the uh, no one on the committee of the 12 of you is is should be speaking for the committee you know the, for the advisory committee you have your own opinions that you bring to this process so I'm not I don't understand your what the clarification well, you're trying to the make the words are you'll speak only for yourself and not for so are you really saying just don't speak as on behalf of the committee because we would speak as an individual right right all right that just was unclear. right right similar to you know like when you when you spoke on WIBA radio that was for yourself that wasn't for the committee and you made that clear at the time you of made course. that very clear and when so. you spoke yesterday to the newspaper uh it, you spoke for right exactly the committee and the committee, so. right okay. so um uh a couple other guidelines members will recognize the legitimacy interests and opinion of others opinions of others taking time to listen and understanding comments from all participants a lot of this really goes without saying but we uh, thought it would be good to just make sure we were all reminded um, when making public statements members will speak only for themselves as uh, vice chair just mentioned not for the committee or any other member and members of the general public attending these meetings will be able to ask questions after the committee has gone through the agenda items since there was some discussion about this i wanted to provide uh, staff project staff's thoughts um, this committee as as the vice chairperson just mentioned the intent of the common council was to create an advisory committee that reflected various stakeholder groups in the community so each of you was selected by the council to represent a very a particular perspective whether it was um, airport commission member and pilot the business community uh, the, the two major businesses at the airport um, capital flight and more airplane company uh, middle uh, middleton area development corporation town of springfield resident friends of pheasant branch uh, uh, and uh, people who live under the flight path the idea was to have uh, a town of middleton uh, chairperson sorry i didn't mean to skip over you and a planning commission member so the idea was to have uh, a broad group of, of members serving on the advisory committee to reflect the concerns in the community and so that is why with that uh, structure we thought the questions that would be asked there would be a structure to asking questions in sequence but at the same time making sure that anybody else who has questions beyond the ones that you have would have an opportunity to ask them so that's why the agenda is structured the way it is it was a recommendation we had uh, th uh, at, as the project staff and <coughs> with the acting chairperson that's the structure we proposed so that's the the background for it thank you mark appreciate what's it what's next so we should uh, adopt these uh, uh, guidelines so um, why do we have to adopt them you, you don't need to i guess i'm just so the staff is just is any, well, you could ask if anybody's objects okay. or agrees. Is there any? I, I wanted to do it more formal, but that's fine. Uh, anybody have any further discussion on the guidelines? Everybody can live with these and live by these guidelines. I can, but now are we pausing because we're and we're pausing at the end of each agenda we, item? Let's yeah. finish our business and then we'll right. So is everybody okay with the guidelines? And we'll work with those guidelines. Okay. All right. We will uh, pause here for uh, anyone from the audience that wants to make a comment on the guidelines. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the review of uh, community input from our uh, meeting over at our public forum. And Greg, you'll certainly walk us through that. Right, thank you. So, um, yeah, again, you, we had the, the last um, advisory committee meeting, and I think one of the things we heard loud and clear is the need to really raise awareness that this master plan is, is going on, uh, to make sure people understand the process and how the master plan um, plays out. And kind of taking all that um, into consideration, we, we, we held a, an open house and, and, and workshop. Um, and we had a, a really good attendance. It was at Cromery Middle School. Um, we, through our... Um, notes we we thought we had about 150 people from the public attend um, the goal was really you know like I say to inform the folks of what a master plan is an airport master plan the process that that unfolds um, there's a, a linear process so that it starts with an inventory it works into a forecast of future operations um, from that it develops into a list of requirements um, alternatives are considered uh, and then ultimately 
lead to a, a preferred action. And uh, from that, there's an analysis of funding and, and economics. Um, how do we pay for these improvements? Um, we wanted to communicate that process. Uh, we also wanted to provide a forum for folks to ask questions about the process, um, provide an opportunity for folks to you know, voice their concerns. Um, and so we had stations, um, six stations set up, um, each one sort of talking about the different chapter of the master plan. And each station had a, a flip chart. And so as folks were, were communicating and asking questions, we tried to document those conversations on the flip chart. Uh, we took pictures of that. Um, we provided a, a comment form and encouraged folks to, to take that with them, to kind of take what they had, had heard from that meeting and provide their feedback. Um, so this is kind of a, just a quick summary of, of some of the feedback that we got. Um, we had nine emails the, of comments from that. We had, uh, we've also established a project website for folks to post their comments. Um, we've had 12 posts on that. We've had 25 formal written comments. And then from those flip charts, um, and we've taken pictures of all these and we put them on the airport website, um, we got a good general sense of, of the, where the community's at with, with a lot of the things. Um, so what we tried to do is take all that information and put these comments into categories and try to um, provide a, a summary of, of the, the feedback they were getting. And, and Rob, um, you, you did that exercise, so I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the, the categories of comments we got. Thanks, Greg. So um, again, Rob Sims with Meet and Hunt. And uh, what we wanted to do, because there are a lot of ways that we gathered comments, we had the, uh, everything that Greg just went through, the emails, the written submissions, the project website, and the flip charts as well. So we wanted a way to kind of look at all these things holistically. And so what we did <laughs> was we took the, all the comments, um, put them all together in one matrix, and then started to go through them and categorize them based on the topics that they were hitting on. because. You might have somebody write down on the flip chart that they're concerned about noise, and that's easy to categorize. It's a, a noise comment. But you might also have somebody write a letter that's paragraphs long and touch on a lot of different topics. And so what we would do in that instance was go through the letter, look at everything that their letter hit on, and as it went through these categories, we would mark those categories as they were applicable. So we're just going to go through these. Thanks, Greg. That's, that's much better. Um, so we're just going to go through these and kind of talk about each category briefly to make sure we all have a handle on really what it means. There, some of them are pretty self-evident, but are self-explanatory. I, I have a quick question. Are these percentages on the uh, scale or are these actual numbers? These are numbers. And so for each occurrence of these topics, that's one uh, check mark. And that's what you're seeing here. We should add that you know one, one comment could have covered several categories. Right, so if someone wrote a letter hitting a lot of different topics, um, it might have hit every single one of these categories. And so we, you're not going to have an exact, um, you know, equal count based on how many comments were received. So just to go through these, so first off, property values, uh, fairly self-explanatory, just people being concerned about what type of impacts the airport and activity might have to the property value of their homes. As you can see, uh, about 15 comments landed in that category. Moving on to public involvement. These comments varied just a little bit. Uh, they could have been anything from being in support of the open house or critiquing the open house and saying it could have been a bit more clear. We had that as well. And also saying that the public engagement could have started early. That was uh, another thing that popped up a couple times. So that's what the public involvement um, category takes into account. Environmental uh, is a little wider. Of course, we had some noise uh, complaints or comments on noise, as you can see at the end there. But some of these might have even said that the noise impacts were not just for people, but it could have been affecting the animals in the area or um, concern about any type of environmental impacts from the airport. So that's what goes into that category. So the miscellaneous, obviously kind of a catch-all phrase, but we did find there were a couple themes that would pop up, but just not in enough numbers to really create separate categories for them. Miscellaneous categories, things to be, a lot of financial things, either financial impacts to the area as a whole. It could have been what the uh, hangar rent was or what the operating budget for the airport is each year. Um, so things like that. Uh, it also had a few other things that really were just kind of standalone, like questions about dra uh, excuse me, drone regulation. So that's our miscellaneous category. And then next, as we move into the general community impact, you can see the, the numbers start to tick up there. So just shy of 40 hitting that category. And again, that's um, it, one comment can hit each category. So general community impact, 
of course all these are community impacts but general community impact is a little more nebulous so for instance somebody might say that they don't like the way that noise would impact the community because they have always seen the community as you know in a certain light just has a certain feel to it and they don't want it to change that certain feel changing that certain feel would be kind of a general community impact so a little more nebulous but just an a impact on the community and then the second to last moving uh, either moving the airport or expansion on the airport um, those two major changes were grouped together it, uh, moving really only occurred a few times so I didn't think it merited its own category but expansion of course was a big concern uh, popped up several times just people being concerned about potential expansion of the airport how that actually manifested as far as what the specifics of the um, expansion that they were worried about uh, could have varied and then finally we do get to the noise and aviation activity so uh, most of these were pretty straightforward just concern about airport uh, airport noise although just for clarity they might have said something along the lines of I don't like the way that airplanes fly really low over my house and nowhere in that sentence so they actually say noise but that's clearly the concern is noise and that's what we would group it as and so that's how we went through this um, and just to reiterate, uh, we might have to zoom back out. Yeah, thanks. So just to reiterate these, all the comments, this is just a summary of them, but they are available online. And uh, she has something else. Okay, and Marco, go ahead. And I wanted to add that uh, at your places tonight, I've placed some additional messages that we received uh, in the last few days. It's titled Messages Received After May 24th. Um, and I can upload these as well. I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. These came in uh, largely earlier this week. One of them, by, just for explanation, is um, uh, from Michelle Lewis. Um, she had written on May 22nd, and I checked my spam folder draft, or I mean a deleted folder. I checked all my folders. It was not in my inbox, and she accepted that explanation. So um, she had rewritten to us on June 2nd. So that is why that wasn't in your previous packet. It was, uh, I can't explain why we didn't receive it. Um, and then Lou Posakini uh, and a few others. Um, Bartlett Durant uh, sent a second message. Uh, Bill and Diane Taylor, uh, Leslie Hainer provided a survey, uh, results of a survey that uh, a group uh, re recorded from the community and uh, James Scorgy. So those are at your places. And those have not been included in any inventory because they came in after the, uh, uh, after the timeline we had ori originally established. Thank you. I, I'd like to go on record and express my appreciation for everybody that took the time to make those comments, including Michelle and Leslie. And I, <clears throat> I have to say I read every word of every sentence on every on every uh, uh, comment form so I feel I've got a fair assessment of what the community's concerns are thank you any other comments from the advisory group yes. go ahead yep. well I have to say that I'd like it pointed out for the record because I really appreciate the work that has gone into doing this but like it's Mark, right? I've read every single word on every single page, and I think it's important to point out that they were overwhelmingly opposed and had a hu and some pretty serious concerns about expanding the airport in various ways. And that's not all that clear to me I, from reading what's in your analysis. So I just I want that to be in the minutes, and I want it very clearly stated that they, are, they were overwhelmingly opposed to an airport expansion option being included. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Um, we'll accept these uh, comments and uh, move on. So before we do move on, what are the future plans for more public participation? So, um, Meet and Hunt Scopus Services included the inventory analysis that was being done and in, in that included the user survey, which was focused on 
uh, users of the airport and pr prospective users. The city committed about a year ago uh, at the airport commission to do a community survey once the planning process, once it's evolved and there's some alternatives that are discussed. So once there's information to take to the community on specifics, um, that there would be a community survey and that would be conducted by the city that's not part of Meet and Hunt's scope of services. So that is something that we felt was more appropriate for the city to do. Well, when is this going to occur, though, as far as public input? Is it after every meeting of this committee? Is it going to be at a regular basis? When will people get a chance to say what they want to say about what's going on? Well, that's what the intent of the agenda item was. Well, we had the open house. Uh, obviously, the first meeting, there was public comment. Then we had the open house to uh, try and help uh, explain what the process entailed and to receive comments and questions. Um, the idea now is to have these meetings, a few meetings that were outlined in the original timeline, if that timeline needs to be adjusted. We're, we're going to discuss this later on the agenda, but there's, there's flexibility here to respond to the needs of the, the, and the wishes of the advisory committee. Um, but ultimately, there will be a community survey and a public hearing before any adoption of a master plan. Well, I see you have October as a time when you're going to have a workshop, apparently. It, it, again, it's a it was it, it's a template that was used, and if there's a need to adjust that time, we have not. There's no deadline that we need to be you know by October 31st that there needs to be a plan completed. We were just trying to provide an original timeline based on Meet and Hunt's work with master plans and other communities and what their workload can accommodate. Uh, the idea was to you know here's the structure of what we plan to do, much like what the school district does with with their planning processes where they identify uh, uh, issues that they would like to address. They have a facilities planning committee. Then they develop a proposal. They, they get the community engaged with a survey, ultimately um, make a decision after the public has had a chance to weigh in. So that is actually, I think, a fairly comparable example of what this master planning process is supposed to be. It's totally understandable that uh, the first meeting, the public said, hey, we're really concerned. We want to know, know more what, what's going on. And so that's why we are taking this step to try and let people know what we are doing. We obviously didn't do a good enough job explaining the master planning process out of the gate. And so we have been trying to take care of that step now with the open house and with the structure going forward. So how do you feel about that as far as compared to other airport plans you've dealt with? As far as the public involvement? Yeah. Normally, with most of the projects that I've been on, we try to bring a plan to the public yeah. um, once we have at least something drawn up. So in my experience, we've started this process earlier. The public involvement process. The public involvement yeah. process, thanks. Yeah, well, let me give an example of a project. Just, a, just one comment, yeah. Bob. Um, the, I mean, hypothetically, we could come up with a, with a, master, a revised master plan that says we're going to do absolutely nothing we're not going to adopt any of the recommendations I, hypothetically so that's going to be a totally i mean I, at, at one point i mean how do you you're going to survey the i suppose you can serve could you could survey the community saying there's going to be no changes in the airport how do you feel about that on the other hand it could be say we're going to be adopting all of the recommendations and then this the community would would really want some some feedback so I agree with the plan is to let's wait until we have something to present to the community so they have something to react to well, but I absolutely already stuff out there on Saturday these four airport potential airport projects was handed out and it's on the website of the city well I, I agree but that's what's the first word on that well, okay but potential I understand, but then I read the newspaper today, and I'd really love to hear from Town of Springfield about the sensitive environment uh, area or next to the airport and how that may be impacted because you can't, it's where all the water is. potentially are. impacted, Cynthia. I mean, that's just, I'm not trying Mark, to I, argue. Mark, I agree with you, and I think it's important that the public know why the master plan is necessary, and I don't know that that's really been addressed, Mark. I know the airport commission minutes have discussed why we need a master plan. As Mark said, whether the master plan states that everything remains as it is, which is definitely an option, or whether things change. But the federal funding is is on lockdown yeah. without a master plan in place. So That's exactly right. 
and the federal funding is is very important because it's a 95 five percent match with the federal government coming up with 95 percent of the funds for any projects that are on our master plan so yeah. why is that the first time we're hearing that that's well really exactly important. that's well we should that's what we're here that. for this is the advisory committee so that we can talk about these topics no, i know but what you just said could you say it again 95 percent of the funding is coming well from and i'll leave that to you know the airport commission to confirm but i believe it's a 95 five percent match with federal funding that they will not unlock without a master plan in place wait wait yeah. Anything that would be changed in the master plan? Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're not addressing the public at this point. Got it. So there was some clear, Greg or Mark, do you want to just address that? Uh, I, I the just funding have, racial, if you well, will. <laughs> yeah, I could. I, and I just wanted to maybe get back to Bob's original question about what we were envisioning with, with the public involvement. Sure. Which I think we got a little yeah. bit off track here. Yeah. But, um, you know, as we talked, the, the master plan is generally rolled out in chapters. It's a, a linear process. It's a step-by-step -step process. And, and the way we had sort of envisioned this and scoped this, and, and we didn't scope this in a vacuum. We scoped it with the Bureau of Aeronautics, and we scoped it with the FAA, who concurred with the scope, is to, at each, the completion of each chapter, to have a meeting like this, to talk about where we're at in the process, and at the conclusion or, or as part of each of these meetings to have an opportunity for the public to ask questions. Um, and, and so that's what we are envisioning. And then we also had in there, and Mark alluded to, uh, a public hearing so that folks can, you know, then have a, a you know, a, a more formal process as we get to um, a plan or a, a conceptual draft plan. That means at the end of every meeting advisory committee, the public can speak on what has transpired or ask questions about the process and, and that's what we were getting at with the yeah. format and the ground rules that we were talking about initially is I think that's the idea is we would get through our agenda we we talk about where we're at and then and then I think that what we're talking about is that at each major topic of the agenda is right. then having the public we modified yeah, yeah. 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 it right yeah. so right. that it's right yes, right. yes it's but been you modified know, I, you know what would right. be helpful is what is the city's vision here I mean I'm really unclear as to what their vision their goal what is their appetite here other than we're just checking boxes to get federal money that really has not been made clear. I, I, I'm actually wondering if it would be more appropriate if there's a council member here. I'm, I can take my sh shot at it, but uh, there isn't a council member who serves on the advisory committee. But I'll, I'll give it a shot, and if somebody, if there's a council member here, they can fill in. But from a staff perspective, from a okay, for, do you want to? Okay, I'm not sure. I can, I'm Susan West. I'm from District 6, Middleton Hills, and I do live under the runway or the flight path. Council would like to know, when was the last time we had a comprehensive plan for the airport, Mark? Uh, we have never. We've never had one. The city has never uh, done a master plan for the airport since purchasing the airport, which is about 20 years ago. Okay. For all of the different things the city does, we have comprehensive plans. There's an overall comprehensive plan for the city. Uh, I chair Conservancy Lands. We just approved at, at Conservancy Lands and then the council a comprehensive plan for what we will do for the con conservancy. Uh, this was the main conservancy. We have them for individual parks. This and they give staff guidance as to what needs to be done when they're planning projects in the future, especially for capital projects. Excuse me, Susan. So through, just as an example cool. of your conservancy plan, that through that process, a vision uh, came out of that process. Yes, that's okay. exactly what, thank you for. So, yeah, so this not, is bringing. The city may not have a vision for the airport at this point in time, but right. it will come forth through the master planning process. Yes, that is what I see this process is giving the city a vision of what is needed based on what this advisory committee, the airport commission, and citizen input. And just to clarify on that vision, it, it could mean just repairing current issues that are needing repairing at the airport as it sits now, correct? Yes, it could go from just. Maintaining status quo, making sure it's safe out there. Which which we can't do without the city having some idea of the current status. Yes. That's 
also why the master plan is needed, correct? Yes, so the master plan, even if we do nothing other than maintaining safety procedures, we need it for that. And I think everybody hopefully will keep an open mind. That's a, one thing we want to do. If we do want to expand, we need to know that. We need to know citizen concerns and so on. So we can come up with a good plan for the future at the airport. Susan, could I ask, has the council, I mean, where did this come from, I guess, is my question. Uh, I think Mark can answer that. Council, let me go over what council's input so far has been. We have approved the committee members. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Cynthia, the um, map that you're referring to that was distributed as part of the, and provided as part of the, um, op the um, a tour of the city that was given to city officials, well, I'm just explaining the tour for, advice, uh, for the audience here. Um, last Saturday, about 50, 55 people boarded a bus and took a tour of various projects around the city um, uh, for the purpose, it just, you know, everything from potential housing developments to conservancy matters to the acquisition of the acre farm uh, proposed by the county, uh, Tribeca and, and ending the airport and Pleasant View Road, et cetera. It, was just, it, it wasn't any one focus area. It was just to introduce uh, council and committee members to the uh, issues facing the city, and there was space for a couple residents to come along as well. Um, and then after that, there was an orientation for new committee members and anybody who wished to have orientation to city government and, and how committee meetings function and, and what their roles are, uh, obligations as, as uh, city officials, as appointed officials. Um, as part of that, we had slides that we presented to, the, the staff had put slides in the PowerPoint that was presented on the bus. This is actually not a, a newly created document. This is, um, that what, was, what Cynthia is referring to, and I don't think we have it um, at our fingertips, it, it's labeled potential airport projects because, the, as, as Mr. Warshower mentioned, these are ideas that have been mentioned off and on for various years. And instead of doing scattershot planning or responding to a specific, well, I'm just saying, instead of responding to specifically to, hey, let's expand the runway, <laughs> And which is an idea that has been discussed for frankly 10 years or more. I mean, there's been people as soon as we opened the airport that said, why isn't it a longer runway? So instead of just saying, oh, let's, let's study just the runway, city officials decided it would make more sense to do a comprehensive master plan. So the reason why I provided that map to, elected to the uh, bus tour was so that people knew that these are projects that have been identified, more land for hangars, longer runway, um, potential improved crosswind runway. I don't know what the fourth issue is that you're referring to. Solar, Solar panels. So, but I'm just so, saying, I mean, I, it, this body should have this information so that we're on the same page as people who've been involved with this for however many years you've been working on this. This body is creating that information. So this is, this is background information that, that I thought it was actually appropriate to say, hey, these are ideas that have been mentioned. And that's why the word potential. Right, right. But it's not, it's not anything new. It's, it's just the idea is that, the pardon me? You it's not new. Right. But, but the point is all these ideas have been out there. And at the first meeting, we couldn't get through the whole packet. So we have a structure, a linear process, as, as Mead and Hunt has, has mentioned. And we are, you know, where do you start? You can't provide all the information in the first five minutes of a meeting. So um, we are trying to go through this process linearly. As, as the council, uh, as council member West mentioned, we have a open slate here, an open planning process that has um, some structure to it based on the consultant experience working with the Bureau of Aeronautics and FAA going through this process to create a master plan. The word potential and to me means potential. It doesn't mean decided. If I may speak, the uh, projects, I, I'm Richard Morey, I'm the airport manager. The projects that are, that you're looking at, uh, have been brought to the airport commission by airport users. The airport commission is a separate body. It's, I'm not a member of it, I'm advisory to it. But it is, uh, its uh, purpose is to promote airport activity. That is specifically what the airport commission should be doing. So it generates, it talks to the users, uh, or the users come and talk to us, and we generate projects that the users are interested in. 
Now this master planning project and, and overall is we're going to look at what is out there, obviously, and uh, bring it to the, uh, the people of Middleton and the area as a whole. And I was, with, at, I was instrumental in getting this uh, diversity on this committee, is requesting it, because I remember the criticism we had when we first purchased the airport and went through that process. There were, we were criticized for not having diversity of opinion, of not uh, getting the information out, although I thought the city did as good a job as they could at the time. So that's what we're doing right now. And if you look at where these projects have come from, they've come from the airport users and suggestions for improvements out there, as well as from uh, in the solar panel, simply a, a business that wanted to use surplus properties on the airport to generate green energy, which I, I have questions about encumbering that property, but I also am very much in favor of green energy. So, But I just wanted to clarify that. That's If you're looking at where the projects or these ideas came from, they came from airport users. What's going to happen with them is not going to be decided by the airport commission. It's going to be more decided by this committee and then the, the city council. Well, well, we'll make a recommendation, right, Rich? Exactly. Yeah. To the and commission, and then the commission will make a recommendation to the council, and they'll, they'll be the deciding factor. Are there any other? Um, yes, yeah, so I'd like to continue go ahead. my question. I, I got interrupted in between it. Go ahead. Uh, the question was um, on prior projects that you have done for other airports, what has been the usual process uh, as far as is it more or less than it has been here as far as public participation? It, it, I'd say it really varies. I mean, every airport is, is unique and every community is unique. Um, we did a master plan at Kenosha recently. Um, uh, very little public involvement, but Kenosha is separate. They're kind of disconnected from the, the city and residential areas that are cut by the interstate. There really isn't too much public concern about the airport. Um, we're involved in one in Milwaukee right now where there's pretty extensive uh, public involvement. So I, I think it really varies from community to community and, and the airport's position, you know, and its environs. So I can't give you one answer and there is no defined requirement. Sure. Yep. Well, the reason I ask is that I know a project that uh, me and I had worked on uh, for Reno, uh, they had five public open houses, one after each major chapter, seven committee meetings, several online public surveys, uh, and um, then there was uh, Durango, five months of community meetings, one final meeting, <coughs> two open houses, two focus groups, six joint study sessions, three airport uh, tenant and user surveys. Well, I'm saying that so far, we don't seem doing as much as some of these other airports, and we need more public participation. Okay, can so, can yep, so in order. Greg, so how, I mean, this is, in my mind, somewhat unique, but I'd love your input because it's right on the border of two other municipalities. <coughs> so, I mean, it's not like it's 100% impact City of Middleton only. Right, you know, and, and like I say, we took an initial stab at this scope and we, we did not develop it on our own. We worked with the Bureau of Aeronautics, we worked with the city, we worked with the FAA and got agreement on, on what we're doing. I don't believe anybody has said we're opposed to additional meetings or additional public involvement. Um, I think we've got that right on our, our slides here. So, um, you know, it's one of budget, it's one of time, it's it's one of how much uh, interest and concern there is. And and every airport community is different. Thousand isn't enough money to have a few more public input sessions. Like I said, we are we are open to anything the the city or folks want to do. So I mean, if, if they feel more involvement's needed, um, we're receptive to that. Does the city have to request that then? Um, you know, I, and the are, public requested. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it can be requested. We are we are not contracted with the city. Our contract is with the state Bureau of Aeronautics, the state DOT, who acts as an agent on the city's behalf. So our contract is with the state. Um, so I think they would have to be involved in, you know, in some of that discussion as well. What's but I don't think they're opposed to it. What's the I mean, process in the event that? Yeah, excuse me for a second. I'll just shut down. And oh, get the thing my apologies. Yep, yeah, one second. What's the process if the public committee, whatever, wanted to get more public participation through meetings, surveys, or whatever? How would that happen? 
Mark, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> um, this advisory committee is can it provide any advice that it wishes. And if your advice, which we heard on April 11th, was to have more public input, that led directly to the open house. So the process is working, Bob. And it's also um, going to be after every meeting. Of if that's what you would like to do, oh, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. So I just, I, I would say that your role as one of 12 and any elected official in the room, if they wish to have a different direction for the process, this is why you're here. That's right. I'm requesting that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I know that we had that oh, that that open house was held, but if you actually read the comments, many many people did not like the format because they felt they couldn't speak en masse and they okay. couldn't and there was a lot of misinformation that not misinformation, differing bits of information, and it was noted over and over in the comments. So if right now we're talking about this and we're saying let's do some more, one, I would be in favor of if the public's in favor of it, and I think you have to take the temperature of the room to figure that out. But if we're going to do it, and again, I would like to have that conversation about how the public is allowed to, ex to, to be part of this conversation because people were very unhappy with it. And it's abundantly clear in these comments if you go and look through them. And I think we just need to be honest about that and try to try to figure out a good a good way to let the public into right. this well, process. That, right. and aren't we doing that now with the public invited to all the meetings? Yes, I, I, I think we are. But there are also times when you're talking about three minutes per speaker, four to five speakers. Some people are going to have to leave. There are people here who have kids. They're older. There are many reasons why they're going to leave. Whereas if you have certain times set and, they're, and if this is what the public wants, then they can, we can have a hearing where they don't have to wait. Do you know what I'm saying? They can say what they want, and they can sort of lead the discussion. That's what I'm a little bit in favor of. OK, so we've heard about some additional uh, public input. Um, and I think we need to bring this to a close because we were really talking about the review of the uh, community input. But it sounds like what I'm hearing is that we're looking for uh, more uh, public input, maybe more opportunities than at the end of each one of our advisory meetings um, and after each major topic. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Is that we want I mean, more than that? I think we agreed today you know after each topic to have public input we which did. provides an opportunity right. for that but i think if we're just going to have general open houses or you know a, a, a community forum for the community to speak we have to have a set procedure to do that because just having people come in and provide comments and have meet and hunt categorize those comments again and again is not going to get us any further i don't have a problem and again i would be guided by the public i have no problem with setting topics for discussion. I do have a problem with dividing it, p people up into little tables and asking them to go from place to place because if you, and I think everybody at this table was prob and a lot of people in the audience were at that open house and people were trying to, at the beginning of each hour, they were trying to have a group conversation and it was totally cut off. And I'm, that was why I didn't like that process to begin with. And so I'm really very happy to, to get, a, get it a little bit directed. But I would like to see it where the people can all. Yeah, to it's each my other. understanding that that format was not just pulled out of thin air. That that was based off of a format that was used for, I believe, the school referendum. Well, actually, let me. Um, I can take a shot at it because I was involved in the format being uh, chosen with working with Mead and Hunt. Uh, can you hear me? So, what happened is at the. Uh, uh, meeting that the first meeting we had the meeting went three hours more than three hours and people couldn't st they, they are standing room only and people were not accommodated because they couldn't all speak or fit in the room and we knew there was a lot of interest we all saw that so knowing that there was a lot of community interest we thought all right let's maximize the opportunity for public the public to come and interact with project staff and so we, we came up with this idea of having the stations, which has been done in other meeting formats and other groups, not just airport related. Um, Dane County uh, Highways uh, recently did that same format for Highway M. So the idea actually was to make it more convenient for the public 
to come and interact with each of the stations to share their concerns, to comment in various formats, whether it was post, um, writing on the board, uh, writing a, in an open house form, sending us an email. We did everything we could to try and maximize input. Now what you're referring to um, in terms of the top of the hour where there were presentations, um, that was something that I wrestled with on the spot with the project staff here. The difficulty we had is we had advertised a certain format. If we had then suddenly said, okay, let's now have an hour-long discussion, people who had come and already left could have said, oh, well, had we known that, we would have stayed. You ch now you changed the rules. So it, we, were, we did the best that we could. Maybe we could have done a better job, but we did the best that we could at the time to try and accommodate as much public input as possible. And as was mentioned earlier by other speakers, yeah, some people have kids, they have obligations, they want to be able to, they don't want to have to wait their turn for three hours to talk. So we are trying to be responsive. I, I actually really respect what you said, Mark. I just think that there's a value as well in having group conversations, and that's what I want to make sure that as this process goes forward, we include. I didn't have a problem with the format that you set up at all. I had a problem with the fact that people were obviously trying to spark a, convers a group conversation and they couldn't do it, and I think we need to provide another opportunity for that if it's at all something that the committee that this committee agrees would be valuable. Yeah, I, I think it's appropriate, but I do think we need to have the plan because you could yes, have 50 people screaming that they don't want yeah. drone Amazon drones delivering from the, yeah, the Middleton Airport and flying that. over the neighborhoods which no I don't disagree with all right that. or, or it, with what Jade was it, saying it, either for it them. sounds like there's some folks on this advisory group that want additional public input beyond what we have talked about so far is that is that a group uh, of this advisory group is that Yes. The message, yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right. I agree, uh, but only in a, in a specific format with a specific goal. Okay. Let's turn that back to staff and have them come up with a recommendation as to how they want to accommodate this recommendation. And uh, we really do need to continue um, the review of the community input. Is there any more, uh, Greg, or... Yep, just, just a minute, Susan. Yep. Um, relative to uh, item four, a uh, review of uh, community input. Okay, hearing it. Susan? Okay, yeah, in terms of community input, it's crucial for this com council to have that information. What I'm concerned about is we don't have a plan that the community can actually react to yet. So I would like to see possibly schedule one or two public hearings after there's initial plan where the community can react to it. Then this committee could go back and make changes if they want to in response to the um, community input. But I've been concerned and I've heard and I've gotten emails about <coughs> lots of things that I have asked questions about like can certain size planes land here, like 757s? And I've been told that even if we extend the runway to 5,000 feet, it's not possible. So I'm concerned also that there's lots of misinformation out there. And I would like the, just for the benefit of council, so that we can react to accurate information as to what the plan will be. So a couple of public hearings after an initial plan is set up with an understanding it might need revising. Okay. Let me take a different <clears throat> viewpoint on that though. In designing a building, for example, well, one of the first things you may do is do a lot of, you can call it user survey, the behavior of the people who are there, have jobs to do, and so forth and so on. That precedes any kind of plan. From what you find out about the people who are actually the users of the environment, we develop what's called a program, which is a, a series of performance criteria by which you want the plan to follow. And sketches, plans, alternatives, come from that it's not a matter that you can review comments after the plans at that point but to get to the plan you have to find out first who is doing what how frequently who needs this who needs that then the plan begins to evolve so but isn't that what, well, that what was, what's not what we're doing with the next topic on the agenda and 
why we did the the inventory and the and the research in terms of what the the growth was. I was going mean, to say that's that sounds exactly what Mead and Hunt did with their initial surveys. Well, except though, uh, what has just been said is get a plan, then public reaction. I'm saying you have to have public uh, input early about what they maybe like or don't like about the airport, uh, what has been problems with it in the past, what they would like to see in the future. From that, you can build a plan. And the inventory is part of that. If you're doing a building, you might do furniture inventory, you might do inventory of almost anything. It all becomes part of the program that fits into the performance criteria to define what the plan should be. But a lot of the questions you just asked were actually in Mead and Hunt's original surveys. That's fine, but uh, the public the pilots, participation the pilots. Has pilots. Well, they did two rounds of surveys. And, a yeah. pot and potential pilots in a multi-state area. They never surveyed the community at this point. So, so you're really saying the community unfair. surveyed. Well, that, but that's like surveyed. surveying people on the east side oh. for a building on the west side. Because that's not what you said in your comment. You talked about the airport environment and does it work for the current user. That survey was done. Of, I'll use an analogy of well, a building. Well, wait, wait, wait. Just, just wait. Hold, hold on here. I think what we're talking about is we are recommending additional public input. Right, exactly. Okay. Now let's let staff sort out how we're going to accomplish that and come back with a recommendation. Okay. I'm going to strongly recommend that's before there's any formal things on paper with public hearings because then it gets more in concrete even though you can technically revise right. it. Right. Each perception becomes reality. Right. And we have some stopgap, if you will, public input process that we've kind of developed tonight after each major topic. So we will use that until we hear um, some more formal ideas of how we might want to accomplish public input going forward. Okay. So are we, are we done talking about the review of the community input? Sure, we fine. set here? Okay. Now we have, wait, now we have um, 15 minutes for uh, take comments from the public. So we'll say we're going to start here at 6.30. And we would like to request that people who might need to go be allowed Thank to speak you. first. I think that's what Mr. Morey said. Right. That's, and I thought it was a good that's idea. That's an excellent idea. So go ahead. Um, uh, please. Yep. Go ahead. Please come up to the mic. Give your name. You know, the whole, your name, your address. Hi, I'm Leslie Hayner. I'm the author of the survey that um, a lot of folks here saw on next door and that I provided the results to to the committee here. Um, so, so wait, wait, you're you're now yeah. giving us comments about the community input, right? I guess so. Yeah. OK. OK. So um, I think that w I, something here that, that we seem to be in opposition about is what comes first, the the plan or the input and I think what and, the and this is comments about the community input that we have received okay right? so let me start with this so for Mead Hunt when you guys put up your bar chart that's a purely quantitative analysis I mean you can you basically give us hash marks and there was no no qualitative data there so I think speaking to what Julie first said was that um, like what did it say you didn't tell us what it said you didn't say what the consensus was you just gave us a count of the type of things that you got so give us some content as what people want here want to hear they don't want to hear that you got nine emails that's not important what did they say that's what we want to hear so Cause that was not that provided by the by the categorization of that no I don't you so you got 75 comments on noise what were they what they say okay I mean I I can categorize things. I can sort things I mean, into piles, want, but what's in the pile? you want to know if they were pro or con of noise? Is that what you're looking for? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's what I'm saying. It's, I'm looking for, yeah. We have them all scanned every, every time. Right. Scan and I believe that they're on the website. Right. But here tonight, you're giving a presentation, and you're not, you're not, you're not including not it. You just glossed over <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And, and. Uh, the airport master plan website but i'm just yeah. saying so you like hit on it here and then don't say anything else about it but people are here they want to hear it mm -hmm. okay so that's what i'm when 
you collect the public input and then like what are you doing with it we don't know we're not hearing it here tonight but then to speak to the the next part that you guys talked about about you know the chicken or the egg the plan or the input comes first i think what's where we're at an impasse here on that um, as far as the community input goes is that the public really doesn't see the utility of spending time effort resources money on you guys developing a plan for something to show us when maybe people want to tell you right up front that some of that doesn't need to be done does that make sense like okay okay you're, you're, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. have to ask you to summarize your your comments because uh, we need to move on it's uh you that's three my, minutes are that's about my out. summary yeah, can you please okay. quit interrupting her when she's speaking yeah I, I want to I want to say this very wait politely. it's my prerogative it is after the three minutes is done three minutes is up I know but you we interrupted her from the first line three you interrupted minutes her is from up you've taken easily a minute of my time just by interrupting I've me interrupted I think is everyone's right. point you have another minute okay. so I'd like to reclaim my time um <laughs> In any event, so I think that people want you guys to understand that they actually don't want you to present them with a plan before you're willing to listen to them. You listened to the airport users a year ago, and they're the only stakeholder being taken into account while you make a plan, while the rest of us are being told to wait around and see what it is, and then you'll listen to us. And that's not a great feeling for people, and you're not recognizing that. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody else have uh, comments? We have about uh, eight minutes left. Go ahead. Thank Mike, you. name. <laughs> Got to get up to the stand, man. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for me and Hunt and possibly Mike, Op Mike Opitz. Uh, in regards to the uh, public uh, input of the last meeting, um, how did the results fair with you with other such uh, uh, input meetings you've had with with other airports and I mean is it pretty much the norm that everybody's pretty upset or is it kind of like you know is, is this different you know it, it's hard to make generalizations and again I think it it really depends on on the airport and the environment that it's in um, it's not uncommon for an airport that's near residences and in a pretty dense population area for there to be a lot of public opposition to future airport improvements. Um, so I would say it's nothing uncommon, some of the responses we've gotten. Is that, is that enough, a fair answer? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I just want to know how has this been advertised, this whole, besides going on the Middleton City Master Plan, is it in the, I don't get the Middleton paper, but I just found about it on the, um, on the uh, what uh, the next door page, which is a very it's what what you called social media, but I don't think a lot of people know about it. I really don't think half of the people that are that live in Hickory Woods, that live in Springfield, they don't even know that there's a plan to that there th there's a thought of doing this. So I just want to address how how do we let people know? Because I think every, I think there'd be a big huge contingent of people that would be coming forward. Thank you. There, there has been a website created just for the airport advisory committee. Oh, but that would be one. They know about it. Yeah. 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 Is it in the papers? Is it in the Middleton well, paper? I mean, Middleton. The school okay. has the referendum. It's known. You know, there's a lot of that. The school sent right. a mailing. They're going to need a referendum. Wait, right. Like right. And I think the analogy I tried to make to the school is, is actually a really good one. When there was a space needs at you know the schools were overcrowding the school didn't come out right then and there and, and write to everyone and say should we address the overcrowding at the school they first assembled a committee invited people in the newspaper to create to join the committee process they had a lot of applications they created an inventory assessed alternatives developed a plan and then they mailed to everybody that's exactly what we plan to do that's exactly what we plan to do. We've been planning to do that for, for a year. We've been planning to have a community survey. At, well, in fact, it was uh, eight, spring of last year, the Airport Commission discussed doing that. The process is working. We are trying to be responsive and look at the needs of the airport and the requests that we're getting. And instead of looking at, oh, should we expand the runway or should we add solar, which we decided to do as a piecemeal project, and frankly, some people weren't happy with that, 
but the city council gave the direction to go ahead with that. But rather than keep doing this stuff piece by piece and, or using the school analogy saying, hey, let's add a classroom to West Middleton or let's, do, let's add a school at Pope, you've got to do comprehensive planning. That's what we're trying to do. It is every intention. This meeting and the first meeting was advertised in the Times Tribune. Most people don't read newspapers anymore. So the city has put information on its website. We've put stuff out on Facebook. The town of Middleton has added information to their website. We are doing as much as we can to get the word out. And once we have drafted a plan, the city has every intention working with the town of Middleton and Springfield to collaborate with them on distributing a survey to get feedback. For anybody in the audience, I would encourage you, even if you are not a town of Middleton resident, to sign up for our town listserv. We are very assertively letting people know, and you will get the notice by email. Can I have my three minutes now? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, Jim Scorgi, 8411 Airport Road. We're right across the street from the airport. <clears throat> and uh, I read carefully the report that was uh, put on the uh, internet, and uh, I w there was one line that I would like clarification of, and that is when it says that the FAA will not uh, underwrite an airport that does not have community support. I'd like to know how that's determined. Good question. We might need to defer to somebody from the Bureau of Aeronautics, I would venture to guess, unless Mead and Hunt. I, I guess I'd just ask a follow-up question about where, where that was in a particular chapter or... <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I'm just not. I might be able to address that, having worked intimately with the FAA on a couple of things. Essentially, they need a, the support from the city, as in a financial partner in uh, the project. So that is, is determined by the representatives, uh, the alders, and at a vote to go ahead and forward with the project or not. If there is the assumption is that the alders are speaking for uh, the community. So if there is not a sponsorship uh, forthcoming by the owner the, of the airport, then no project will go forth. So let me make sure I understand that, Rich. Uh, so now you're, you're talking about a project, not a master plan. Uh, that is correct. A project. Uh, now the master planning process needs to happen before any projects right. go right. unless so we're doing it as a add-on to the old one. But yes. Thanks, Rich. I actually would disagree with you, Leaf. Um, okay. That's fine. Because the FAA would not have funded and the Bureau of Aeronautics would not have funded a master plan for the airport if the city of Middleton had not requested the funding. So to, just to clarify your answer, I, I, I think I heard it the right way. What, you, what I was trying to get at there is that there's a difference between a project and a master plan. Right, but I think the, co the questioner is asking about a specific was it, sentence. Was it the context of a project or the master plan? I would say that both. The, okay. the answer is both. If, if you, I shouldn't have my back to the audience, I'm sorry. Um, I would say the answer is both. The, the FAA and the Bureau of Aeronautics would never fund, I can't speak for them, but my understanding is they would not fund or provide funding the 90%, 95%, whatever the ratio is, it depends on specifically what's being requested. But they wouldn't provide that funding if there wasn't local support in the form of, as Rich mentioned, the form of, in this case, the airport sponsor, which is the city and the city council. Yeah. So the city council authorized proceeding with a, a master plan project <coughs> for $250,000, of which the city is paying 50 per, uh, 50,000, so 20%. And the, the Bureau would not have funded that and, you know, done this without city support. That's, I think that's probably what that's getting at. If that's the context, then that's correct. But yeah. and I, yeah. I agree with Mark. That's exactly yeah. the process. So can I ask, because we keep throwing around the word community, and the community, as I just heard it, seems very narrowly defined to mean only City of Middleton, City Council, City of Middleton residents. Well, this really does impact other community yeah, I think in, in, re, in context of this gentleman's question, I think the word community is the owner of the airport, the, the airport sponsor. So it is and, the narrow definition. Well, I, and if we're talking about funding and advancing projects and, and advancing master plans, it's the owner of the airport that needs to initiate that. That isn't initiated by the FAA or, or the state. Okay, <laughs> is now uh, 
<clears throat> okay, it is now quarter to seven. We need to move on to the user surveys. That will come at the end of this meeting. Yep. Okay. So let's move on to the user surveys. Okay. Um, so at, at the onset of the of the master plan, one of the first things we did was to reach out to the the users of the airport and and um, gauge you know how the existing facilities are are meeting needs, what's working well, what's not. In the summer of 2018, um, we developed in conjunction with the, the city and, and Rich Mori, the airport um, manager, uh, a list of questions to be asked of the users. And uh, you know, we were asking uh, a range of, range of things um, about, uh, and I want to just quickly get into the, the categories of, of questions. Uh, uh, so we asked first about the existing use of, of the airport. Uh, we asked a series of questions about how the, the airport is, is used currently. Uh, we asked a number of questions about the future use. You know, if, if, uh, if other amenities were there, what would they like to see? Uh, we asked about facility needs specific to runways. Uh, we asked about facility needs specific to hangars, and those are major um, scoping topics. Uh, and then we also asked them to rank other facilities and other needs, things like the pavement conditions, um, the airspace, the presence of uh, obstructions. Um, and we got, uh, the, the survey went out, um, Rich Mori sent it out to the users and a number of folks that were known to make regular use of the airport. Um, we had 91 responses, um, 61 stated that they actively use the airport, uh, and 26 stated that they use the airport in some capacity for supporting a, a business. Um, through the city's request, uh, the survey was administered through uh, Polco, uh, a, a Middleton-based company, um, and it's available online, it's still available online. Um, and uh, you do need to have an account. Um, that's one of the things we weren't real crazy about is that to, to look at the survey or to take the survey, you have to make an account and, um, and fill out the questions. But this kind of gave us just a, a real general uh, summary of, of some of the feedback. The airport right now is, is, is used really heavily for recreation. There's a lot of flight training operations that go on out there. Um, a lot of the use uh, is by folks that are based out there. Um, but there is a, a pretty good chunk of the airport, roughly 25% uh, that is by itinerant users, folks that aren't uh, from the area that are coming here or businesses are coming here. Um, there are charter services and um, a, a fair amount of, of aircraft rental. Um, I'm sorry, uh, may I ask a question? You yep. said that about 25% were itinerant users? Because on the, on the slide it says 8% itinerant users. So I'm a little well, and, and clarify that, please. Yeah, so um, when we're talking about businesses, business use, itinerant really is, you know, an operation that's coming from the airport to an area that's, you know, leaving to a place that's, that's more remote. Um, that's a, you know, it's not a touch and go, not a training type operation. Um, an op it's, a, it's an aircraft operation that's either coming from a remote destination or, or going to a remote destination. So we kind of lump that in with business, business use as well. This is another one of those, um, a pie chart may not be the most accurate way of representing it because we could get multiple responses, um, but we were trying to make a generalization here. Again, I would encourage if you want to take a deep dive on this survey to go to the Polco website and you can get by question a summary of responses and feedback. And I think that's probably a more accurate way if you wanted to really get into the details of the survey. So Greg, can I just ask because in my reviewing minutes of the airport commission, it seems that two surveys of users and potential users were done and one of the entries in July said that only 6% of survey respondents said their use of it, the airport, was limited by the length of primary runway, which kind of ties into one of the potential uh, runway expansion projects. So how long was this first survey open? And then, because I know there was significant outreach uh, to pilots and users in a seven or eight state area, so it went beyond local. Was that the second survey? That, that, that's the second survey, yep. Okay. Yeah. So, when did the first survey close? The, the first survey hasn't really ever closed. So we've, we've had it up on the Polco website and it's been an ongoing thing. Um, so we've, uh, we've, we've left it up there so folks could look at it, could look at the results. 
Um, so it, it hasn't closed, and, and the numbers may be slightly different from what we're showing here. So what encouraged you to go seven, eight states out uh, as opposed to, like, the whole United States? I mean, wh right. how are you scoping this? Right. So um, that's that's the first survey. I'm getting, getting to the second one here. So yeah, you're, you're correct. You know, when we asked about runway length and things like that, majority of the local users said that the existing run of length was adequate for their needs which isn't surprising they're they're based there now they're operating there now the, the the real question is if we add you know if we're trying to bring in potential users um what does additional runway length if we're trying to bring in businesses or people that are constrained there now um that's a different different group and so in casting a wider net we worked with some of the folks to look at a regional inventory of, of aircraft users. And I'm sorry, Julie, go ahead. No, it's okay. Yeah. I'm just, I'm still confused. First, you're saying that this was just the group of local people, but you've said 25% of the people are itinerant users. Does that mean local itinerant users or people, you said they were coming on and going out. I'm a little bit, I'm still confused because if they're itinerant users and they're from far away, then they seem to be satisfied too. So because you did, you only had 6% of them say, hey, we might need a longer runway. So I, I really, I just want to clarify that, please. Yeah, could I speak to that? Um, since I, we had a list, email list of people that use the airport. And this is a reflective of the people that responded from that list and some of the itinerant users, people from Minneapolis or Detroit or whatever else that use the airport on a regular basis for business were also contacted. Essentially, we're running on the pool of existing users. So they they don't come in all that regularly though because they're itinerants, right? I mean, no, uh, maybe I'm just I'm I'm just following a follow of the words. I don't understand what you're saying here. Sure, I can clarify this if that's helpful. Um, our estimate for the airport as a total is that 25% of users are probably itinerant. However, the reason this shows eight is that this like Rich has said, this uh, user survey just went out to local users. Therefore, this is showing up as 8% for these users, but that doesn't reflect everyone. That's only the local people. So when you say probably, there's no definitive way to know? I mean, it's an estimate. And, and the survey is a sample size. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this is based on a survey, you know, and it, it's a survey. It's not, uh, it's a generalization. It's a, a, a a cross section, I guess you'd say. So, can I so, ask when you did go to the seven, eight state region? I mean, I don't know, maybe you went beyond that, but are you trying to drum up business for this so you have good forecast numbers for the funding, or what was the thinking? We were trying to look at potential users. You know, so if someone is not able to use the airport because of inadequate runway length or doesn't have the facilities, um, we were trying to look at from a regional, would would additional runway length bring them there? Would they base an aircraft here? Would there be an interest in uh, moving from Madison to, to Middleton if, if it, their additional facilities were there? So that was that was the intent of the second survey. And I guess we could get into the, to that one here now. Um, yeah, yeah, so I guess just real quickly summarizing the, the initial survey, survey one. Most of the trips um, by the, the based users, the existing users, are within 100 to 500 miles of the airport. But we do see occasional trips that are as, as far as 1,000 1, miles away, some trips to Florida. And Rich, you could probably um, talk about you know, some of the longer destinations that folks, folks travel to and from the airport. Um, the folks that do operate jets said that they are uh, limited by the runway length. There, there weren't a lot of them, uh, but by and large, what we saw is that the existing length is meeting the needs of the existing users. Um, and, and again, that did not account for potential users, which was the impetus for the, the second survey. That second survey went out in the fall of 2018. Um, again, a more, more broadly cast net. It was a, a regional survey, like you said, that went to the uh, six or seven adjacent states within a radius of the airport. Um, I think we had about a thousand folks. So if, uh, if someone had a, a registered aircraft, they got a, an email from us. We got 81 responses, or I think close to 100 responses. Um, so roughly about a 10% um, response rate. Um, 60 of those folks said that a paved crosswind uh, would aid their use in, in operation. Right. Can I yeah. ask, when you were yeah. talking about the 100 to 500 miles, that's not on the slides that we were given for the meeting? Is that an added? Sorry. What is it should there? be on there. What page are you on? It's on page 15. It's this page here. 
stretch now. No, no, I know, but I, I'm. You're there. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead, Greg. Okay. Um, and, and I guess that's 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 really it. So, and then we had about forty percent of the respondents, you know, regionally say that they would be interested in hangering their aircraft if if there was space to do so. I was going to ask so, you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you went out to separate <coughs> other states, apparently with the intent, maybe under the direction of the city, because you're trying to drum up additional business, which means more traffic, which means more planes, more noise, and so forth. Um, I think there's strong sentiment against that. Why would you want to drum up more traffic here if we already have a satisfactory airport? Who's going to benefit? Well, I think the, the feeling was, you know, the, the existing users, the folks that use the airport now, to, to see that it meets their needs isn't all that surprising. They, they are operating here now. They've invested in the hangar here now. The question is, what would what would happen if, if additional facilities there, what, what additional use would there be? And I think that was the intent. I mean, it's not surprising to see that facilities are meeting the existing user's needs. They're there now. You know, we were trying to, to, to look at the potential of the future, and I think that was the intent of the and broader part, outreach. Part, yeah. part of Mead and Hunt's huh? work scope is in, including an economic impact. Is that correct or no? No. No. Okay. No. So I think what you're asking is what's the economic in impact, right? Well, it's just economic, but why, why bother if you already have an adequate airport for most local users? If somebody wants something bigger, better, whatever, there's Dane County. Well, I think I think maybe and and Greg, you can correct me when I when I go off the go off the rails here. But I think as to be comprehensive as a master plan needs to be, I think there is a reason to reach out to see what other needs may be out there. I don't know, Greg. It, right. That's yeah, and, and you know, we Rich had the the list of the folks that that operate there now. The folks that we know are based there. You know. We don't know who might potentially be interested in it. You know, we know the folks that, that, that do use it now. We're trying to gauge, you know, what interest is out there from folks that we just don't know. And so that was really the, the intent. But does uh, Middleton need that? Middleton th th they may decide that they don't, but I think to, to, to gauge the, what's possible or what the potential is for the future, um, that, was, that was the intent. What states did you go to? Was it ones that people fly it, in here occasionally? It, or how? it, it was... Uh, the, the adjacent states, it was a, within a, a, a nautical mile radius. Jade, you could probably help answer that. You helped yeah, us. Yeah, I helped pull uh, the, the list of pilots and, and airplane yeah. owners. And I think we basically did everything that touched Wisconsin for sure. Right. And then a couple states south of that. I can pull the exact list. I, I don't recall offhand. But we, we set a, a, a general nautical mile range to I'm pull in. What is your, your role? You seem to be very familiar with some of this. Are you connected with Mead and Hunt or? I'm not, so I'm Jade Hofelt and I am um, oh, the yeah, owner of Capital, Capital Flight. Flight. Correct, yep. So I've been attending the airport commission meetings since we've been based at the airport, which has now been four or five years. Okay, so you're in the same position as Rick would be as far as a operator here? Correct, yep. But also having experience being based out in California for eight years and helping develop businesses out there too. Oh. But can I just ask, in all of this reaching out and what build it they might come kind of approach, uh, is there any analysis of incompatibility of land uses, given the fact that the airport to the west is surrounded by many, many homes? And then the other question I have is about the FAA definition of congested, because my understanding is that the FAA, because this has been 20 years since they bought the airport, many homes have been built since then, so it's changed, been more developed, uh, that the lingo is congested and other than congested. But the FAA preliminarily s took a look and said, yeah, west of the airport, that's congested. And so that deals with instead of 500 feet altitude, 1,000 minimum is my understanding, and I'm not an expert on this stuff. But has any of that been taken into consideration in this, or will it be? Yeah, I would think the answer is it will be. I think the initial effort here was to 
gauge, uh, uh, you know, to develop these surveys to gauge a demand and an interest, both existing users and potential users. Um, so a broader again, community then that will include the adjacent municipalities that are impacted by this? You're talking community survey in addition no, to the user I, I'm surveys? I'm talking or? about, because we're using the use of the term community very narrowly in one instance of just City of Middleton, and I'm talking about the community of where all the homes are, where the flights are, the towns that are adjacent to. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. like to use the word community without knowing exactly how you're meaning it. Yeah, and I, you know, again, um, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think we do want, and I think the whole intent of bringing the town and, and of Middleton and town of Springfield into this is to try to have those those voices and opinions brought into it. But this was really a user or a potential user survey separate from a survey to communities or adjacent communities. And that, that will be part of this process. Okay. Any other questions on user surveys? So just one last thing, the, the current airport user survey is gonna remain open on Polco, correct? Yes, yep, and I, I can bring that up, Mark, if, if you're interested, it's one of those tabs there, I believe. And is that secondary survey still open as well then, or is that closed, Greg? Uh, the survey monkey, yeah, I think it's still so, open as well. So they're both yep. still open, and they'll stay open for the foreseeable future, or? Yeah, uh, we, we didn't really see any sense in closing okay. them, so, um, yeah. It Get more important. So, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. It's it, you're right. They're, they're user surveys. I think that's been one of the things that's been addressed. And Mark's got the the user survey on Poco brought up here. You know, the first two questions of the user survey um, are: Do you currently use the Middleton Municipal Airport? Yes or no. Uh, would you use it or use it more if additional facilities or service were available? Yes or no. And you know, if the answer to the first two questions was no, um, you're not an existing user and you have no interest in becoming a, a potential user, um, it, it brought you right to the end of the survey. The questions it, would make no sense to a non-user. Correct. Asking yep. if the runway is long enough would right. would not be ap applicable. Right, and and that's that gets to the fact that these are users. Wait, wait. And, and you still can do that. You can still look at the results. And, and, and like I say, Mark's brought this up. Every single question and every re single response is available for the public to go and look at. And um, you do need to log in and you do need to make an account, but you can, this is all accessible. And this is why the city wanted to do the survey this way um, so that folks can go and look at the results. What we'll do is we'll make a copy of the survey and I'll post it on our city website so that you can see all the questions that were asked of the users. That we can easily do that and just that way you don't have to log into the account. I'll just do a screenshot or, or, or we'll come up with some way to display it. And I'll, we also have a listserv um, in addition to the town. And uh, I will make sure that it, we, when that's available, whenever we update our website, I send out information about that. Excuse me, can second we? survey also, I wasn't able to find that. Is that on SurveyMonkey, did somebody say? It is, That yep. was a separate company. Yeah, and that one, you don't need an account. Anybody can just click the link and, and look at it. it's still out there? I wasn't it is, okay. yeah, and, and we, can, we can make sure that that's on the airport website. Right. Yep. Okay, does the advisor committee have any more comments, questions on the user survey? I just have one Go ahead. comment. And I don't know if it's the right time or place, but I'm gonna just go ahead and, and say that I think what we're hearing from a lot of people in the audience, and I'd like it to be noted, is that there feels like there's a basic injustice in, in surveying people who are gonna use the airport first without set, setting it within the community environment at the same time. And I think that should be expressed in the minutes of this meeting. That's what I wanna say, that's all. So, so be. Okay. All right. Any other comments from the advisory committee on user surveys? All right. As what we had agreed to, we will now open it to the public to provide any comments they'd like to on the user surveys, and we will close it at 20 after 7. Go ahead. Take, um, you, uh, you, said you, gotta, you gotta go to the mic, because there's folks that are watching uh, on TV. From what was up on the board, um, 46 people have said that it would be advantageous for them to have a crosswind um, landing field. Yeah. So that's 46 people that we would, you're talking about writing a, an airport plan for and spending the money in excess, and yet 
there's 46 people here that haven't been asked anything yet. And this is why we feel frustrated. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else would like to uh, make comment on the user survey? Can I only respond to the user survey? At this point, that's what we're talking about. This yes. is what's really frustrating well, about your process. Well, could you talk about something that you, you weren't able to We agreed to talk about 15 minutes after each topic, and I right. would like it. There's still time. Isn't there? Okay. Is there anybody else that has would like to talk about the user survey? Is there anybody else that needs to leave? Okay, seeing that, now we can talk about anything you, you'd like to talk to that's taken place prior to. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, the first woman that was up here put together a pretty nice survey, I thought. And my question to uh, the folks at Mead and Hunt is, in all your data, did you include her survey? Did you include it? Um, to, to be honest with you, I think I just learned that there was a separate community survey done. I think Mark let me know. I, we didn't know about it. Um, so. I Included in our consideration of the, of it, it was okay. sent to all the committee members, and so I read okay. every sentence of Me every too. word of every sentence in that survey. So it reached the people that. Well, that's important, but it should be in their master plan summary too. <clears throat> Otherwise, what it demonstrates to me is that there's some type of selective hearing going on. You know, yeah, no and that's, that's a big problem right now. I mean, I have to tell you, I feel like the whole process has been kind of disingenuous and divisive to a certain degree. And I want to warn you about that because I think that you shouldn't take that lightly. Um, you know, if you're not listening to the public. So here's a question for everyone, I guess. How seriously are you going to take public comments when you're weighing your decision about what happens to this airport. Right here. And I want to direct the answer. Gonna take, I'm right going to right take here. a lot. I mean, it right weighs very important. That's you. Right here. Okay, how about everyone else? Seriously. Yes, very much so. Yeah? Very important. Absolutely. How's it going to weigh? I ask everybody I know what they think of this thing. That's what I do. I hate to tell you. Yeah? I represent the people and their views. Because you know that the risk for everyone, and I don't, I don't mean to like point the finger at anyone here, but the risk is that if you don't listen to public's opinion about this, the citizens, it means you're not uh, really a public servant. You're like a corporate servant. Okay, and okay. and I don't mean to slap anyone's face here, but that's the perception that I think a lot of people have right now is that. It's the pilots and Epic and UPS, FedEx, anyone else that might fly a plane out of there, your perspective, uh, you know, you're putting them ahead of the public. Be Thank careful you. with that. Yep. I have a procedural question for as the minute taker. Would you like me to be recording names and addresses for the minutes? I'm looking at uh, anyone who, who's in, interested in the parliamentary aspect of it. My name is John Bauk. I'm, do you want me to capture names or not? Is that the will of the? Otherwise, it's going to be. I would. I think uh, at least names. I don't know that we need okay. addresses unless you guys think we do. John, how do you Wait, spell your last name? B a u c h. Yeah. yeah. And Mark, I'll make one more comment. I think the reason you didn't receive my wife Michelle's email <clears throat> is because the email that was included in, uh, I think it was either the city of Middleton as a link, or maybe in the flyer that was handed out at Cromray, was a different email from the one that you responded back to us on. Uh, both, both email email addresses work, or should be working. You checked them both. They, they both come to the same account, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. We will include names and addresses in all public comments. I did not capture the name of the previous speaker, a woman who um, spoke. Me? Yep.
Thank you. Thank you. Hey. There may have been somebody else. Yeah, there was somebody else who uh, asked earlier, how was this advertised? How do we let people know? I didn't, I don't know who asked that I question. I pretty well anyway. Uh, my name is Carol Schiller. I live at 7689 Schiller Court in the town of Middleton. And I, I think this has to do with, with the survey of the pilots. So I'm straying a little bit away from what I would like to say. And we all know that this is a very nice established neighborhood out there. But the one thing, I walked from one building to another with Mr. Opitz the other night. And t tell me if I'm correct, Mr. Opitz, in, in how I interpreted this. You said that there were some pilots that, that have their planes there, I, I think, and that they like to go out in the wintertime. And in order to do so, it, was, it would be slippery, and so they would like a longer runway. Am I correct? I believe what, I, what our conversation was, um, you, I think you had asked a question about why, would, why are some people requesting a longer runway? I think that was your question. And what I said was, um, just like with driving, when the surface is dry, you have one set of conditions, but when there's rain or snow, then you need more room to stop. Exactly. This is the same with an airplane. But did you not say that there were folks that requested that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If, uh, for 10 years, more than 10 years, we've had requests from people to have a longer runway. So do you really feel for the few people that might have to go out in the wintertime should put this? And just to clarify, it's not just winter operations. It is rain, so right. year-round operations. Yeah. That's, That's our quiet time. time. We need any quiet time. But I do think that I, I do think you made reference to the winter, did you not? I, I, I would have said rain. I yes. would have said both rain and winter. I would have. But, but to disrupt said both. the lives of these people in an established neighborhood, for the few people that might need a longer airport or, or a longer runway, and, and and did you not say that that the big jets are not going to be coming in there? Now, what did you mean by big jets, and what would be the largest jet that would come in? We don't have all that information because we haven't gone through the planning process. I, I can't answer that because I know that 757s and these large commercial jets. Yes, we know that they can. But, but I, what would be the maximum that would come in? This is why it's helpful to go through the planning process so that we can provide you with an information that okay. is based on facts. I okay, don't know. But now that we answer. come back to the chicken or the egg. Right. Do, do you feel that you should spend the money, do all of this planning if the people don't want it? I, you know, any sort of planning, any sort of planning process at the city, and I'm, I'm sure it's like this in the town of Springfield and town of Middleton too, you do various planning processes as Alder Susan West mentioned. Mm -hmm. And some people don't want to see more schools because they don't have kids in the schools. Some people feel our conservancies and parks are adequate. They don't want to see us invest in more parks. Not everybody, think, not I, I everybody uses all from, services. I, I, I think understand. we're veering away from the conversation. All right. So anyway. I, I'm just saying not everybody uses all services in a community and the, the city council wanted to see a master plan completed as a recommendation from the airport commission. But, but, it, but it seems like the, the folks in, 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 the, in the town, of, well, in, in this area are satisfied with, with, with the services that they're receiving. And, Is and that that's correct? okay that you're satisfied, but earlier in the meeting we talked about a master plan being required by the city council so that the city has a plan in place moving forward, just like they do for parks and, and everything else. So even if nothing changes, which might actually be the case, the city needs a plan in place. And that's why we're developing the master plan. Could you tell me how many people on this commission have airplanes or are affiliated with the, with the, um, with the airplane industry? Sure, well, I think, yeah, I think uh, as, we can as Rich said, we try to get a, a general what is the ratio? And how many people? There are five people on the commission that I'm aware of who have pilot's licenses, and they're tw on the committee. Excuse me, and there's uh, a total of twelve committee members. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Others. Wait, wait, wait. We need name and address, please. Okay. My name's Robin Lindsell, and I live in the town of Middleton. 
And these are the exact same arguments we heard when you increase the length of the runway from 3,500 feet to 4,000 feet, the exact same arguments and why it was widened. And that's because those planes using the runways didn't feel safe in different kinds of weather, and that's because they were smaller planes. Now we have bigger planes, and so they want a longer runway. So they can, you know, and it's just going to snowball. I mean, these are the exact same words, and they pretty much promised back then it would be impossible to have a longer runway than 4,000 feet because we're surrounded by wetlands. Right. So that's what I have. Thank you. I'd like to uh, comment on that. I've said this to the commission, <laughs> yeah. and also you've got copies as a member of the committee. But let me repeat it because some may not have heard this. Um, and again, I'm quoting from uh, a source. Even the largest typical business jet can land in less than 4,000 feet. The Gulfstream 450 is one of the largest business jets and can land in 3,250 feet. Typically, an aircraft operator chooses to base it at an airport <coughs> that can accommodate their aircraft, or they choose an aircraft that can operate out of where they want to be based. Airports are not typically reconfigured to accommodate the aircraft someone chooses to fly to. They choose to fly at the airport which they choose to fly from. And I'd like to do ask a question, because we have a person here who's with the Capital Flights. You're a uh, service dealer, representative, whatever. And now they have a plane that needs 5,000 feet to land. Are you going to be having that plane as part of your inventory? No, we don't have any plans for that currently. OK. Just to make sure, because uh, uh, some might see it currently. as a justification for having long runways, so it can accommodate a particular aircraft. So that means you're lengthening the runway to accommodate an aircraft that's being marketed by an operator here. Okay, so we don't get into a debate here or debate. discussion. I'm questions, okay. um, this is the public's time, and I'd like to uh, respect that and give anybody else from the public that would like to make a comment. Uh, Steve Waldorf, uh, 7480 Indigo Circle in Middleton. My big question is, um, I saw that, I mean, you obviously have done a user survey for the pilots. Why did it take a private citizen to have to do a survey of citizens, why did it have to come to that? Why did we not have in some kind of survey for us for this process, process to even, might have just stopped at that. There's a lot of opposition to it, so I'm kind of curious as to why that wasn't ever um, entertained. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, it's a question for the city, because um, it's not part of Meet and Hunt's scope of services. Um, as I mentioned half an hour ago, um, the city is committed and has publicly stated it will do a community survey. I can't speak, you'd have to ask Ms. Hayner why she did the survey at this point in time. She, right, or whoever is, yeah, I can't speak for her. Right. Uh, Kyle Larson, 4863 Enchanted Valley Road. Um, and again, what Leslie said, and I think what, what this gentleman is also saying, is at the beginning, in the, the way to start the planning process, what you're looking at, you guys said that you are going to look to see what businesses might want to come here um, if we expand. Um, you're, you're being very hypothetical maybe is, would be your word in how you're looking at it. But you're not being hypothetical or even factual in the way you're looking at the way residents feel. And it's incredibly insulting to take a jump off point when you're only considering airport users because I think what you're hearing from everybody here is nobody in the community, none of the residents, want an expanded runway. So why are you even considering it? I think that's the bluntest way I can put it. And I'd like a blunt answer. Do you feel you're speaking to for all the citizens of the, I feel the like area? A lot of them, yeah. Well, I oh, let's take a show of hands, Lee. That's the people that are here. She speaks for you. Okay. I'm a citizen too. I'm putting my hand up on that. I'm sorry. I just am. You know, I think it's important. It's important to let them talk. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you're asking about a community survey. And obviously. But you also made the blunt statement that nobody wants a longer runway and that survey that you just referenced has but the survey that you are referring to that had 290 responses 60 of them were removed
because they weren't, didn't meet the criteria of being within four miles. And several of them, if you look at the text that's in your own survey, there's several people who said it's too early to make a decision and there's some people who supported the airport. So to make the statement that nobody supports a longer runway as a hypothetical. Oh, oh. Anyway, so okay. I, don't, okay. I don't think it's good to get an argument. I, I, yeah. The wait, point wait, is the city's wait. committed. Okay, just, just, yeah. just stop. We are now at 20 after. I need to close the public comment period for this topic and move on to the regulatory environment uh, topic next. And so that would be um, Greg. Please, please. Could I have the please. Order. Where's the citizen? Leave for, for the record, could I ask for a one sentence summary of the question that's being asked so that we can address it at a later time, okay. please? Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to item six now, uh, regulatory environment. Okay, well, um, we, we had a, an open house. We had the, the, the public uh, forum, the workshop. We got a lot of feedback from the community. We got feedback from the users of the airport. And in trying to respond to the questions that we've got, and to try to respond to the feedback we got, we felt it was important for folks to understand the regulatory environment that an airport exists in. So even though an airport is a city-owned facility, it is beholden to a number of federal restrictions and obligations. By taking federal money to, to fund the airport, um, the city is um, essentially, there's a lot of um, strings attached to that. And so Rick Dunkelberg is here. Rick has worked on uh, a, a number of noise studies. He's uh, one of our more senior planners at Mead and Hunt, and he's going to walk through the regulatory environment uh, discussion. And um, Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. That was very nice of you to call me a senior planner instead of the old gray-haired guy. Uh, I appreciate that. Let me see if this can work. Uh, thank you all. I think it's uh, important important that we set the context for the environment that an airport works in. And so I want to talk about the federal side of the regulatory environment. I'm not going to address state issues because I'm not an expert at all in what, what this particular state has. <clears throat> but um, let me see if I can kind of take this out of here. The, uh, I've, I've been doing this for 45 years and I've done it at hundreds of airports and a lot of the questions you're asking are very similar to all the other airports I've worked at. But it's very important to, to understand that, and this is a very succinct uh, description, that a public use airport is the only public facility owned and operated by a local unit of government, which is almost totally preempted by the federal government. It's not like parks, it's not like schools, it's not like anything else. And that's very difficult to understand and to put in the context of how that affects a local community because there are so many strings attached. And I want to go through real quickly some of the major elements that from the federal side affect the overall regulatory environment that a, uh, an airport has to operate under. And uh, Next one, please. Uh, the first one is federal preemption. Federal preemption basically says that the federal government, and in our case the FAA, has overtaken the rules regulations of certain aspects of, of, of aircraft and airports. And basically what they have done is, very generally speaking again, the feds through the FAA have preempted the management of the navigable airspace along with aircraft noise at its source. That's the two major elements. Once an aircraft leaves the ground, it's no longer under the control at all of the local unit of government. And I'm gonna use the term sponsor, the airport sponsor. That's the local unit of government that owns and operates an airport. They are the airport sponsor. And once that aircraft leaves the ground, it's totally under the control of the federal government. The federal government sets how that aircraft flies, where that aircraft flies, what elevation that aircraft flies, the altitude, the airspace, all of those things, with the exception 
that the pilot in charge always has the final word on how they fly that aircraft. But the federal government puts in flight tracks, they talk about approaches, departures, all those things. And once they, in addition to controlling aircraft in flight, they also control the expenditure of federal funds. And what I mean by that is they have a list of what we call eligible items that the federal government will fund for airports and for nav aids and for all those wide spectrum of, of things that the federal government uh, funds for, for any type of airport development. They also control aircraft noise at the source of the noise. What does that mean? That means the federal government tells exactly how loud each aircraft flying is allowed to be. Each aircraft is certified. We as a local unit of government cannot tell Cessna how loud their aircraft can be. We can't tell Gulfstream how loud their aircraft can be. The federal government sets that. And, we, and every aircraft is a cert certificated noise level based on Federal Aviation Regulation Part 36, and so we can't, we can't direct that. And the federal government severely limits the local unit of government, the airport sponsor, from implementing noise restrictions. Prior to January 1st, 2000, local units of governments could adopt local reasonable noise restrictions. But in Congress's wisdom, they took that away from the local airport sponsor. And basically now that all lies in the form of the federal government. Now there are some processes and procedures you can go through, but they're extremely onerous and basically they're they're totally against the community setting those noise standards so that that's something we have to live with which is different than what we used to do 20 years ago well yeah before before january 1st 2000 we used to be able to set those noise limits in a, the next one please in addition to that as you all probably know every time a sponsor accepts a grant from the federal government they sign what are called grant assurances. And those grant assurances are basically a contract between the sponsor and the federal government. And there's 23 or 24 of them, depending on, on what year you're looking at. But they set certain parameters that the airport has to do because they've accepted those federal funds. Basically, they are, you can't discriminate against any user. The airport has to be open to any user that wants to use that airport any time of day or night, however they want to use it. Years ago, we used to be able to say, we're going to limit the type of aircraft at an airport based on noise levels, or based on weight, based on what the runway strength was. But basically, that's all been taken away now. So we really can't do that anymore. <clears throat> you cannot grant an exclusive right at an airport which means if you have the, the uh, property on an airport that is available and is not committed, then that has to be available under reasonable fees and charges for anybody that wants to develop on that airport, as long as they meet your minimum standards. All the grant assurances last for 20 years from the date of your last grant that you accepted, except for discrimination, which goes in perpetuity, and for land acquisition, which also is in perpetuity. There are some airports that say, okay, we're gonna quit taking grants, and we're gonna wait 20 years, and then we'll take that airport over and we can do reasonable regulations and things of that nature. If FAA funded the land acquisition, then that goes in perpetuity. And then again, you can't have any discrimination issues either. Okay, the other um, really uh, important federal statute that we have to deal with is the National, National Environmental Policy Act, and that's called NEPA. Um, basically what that act says is that any major federal action that has a significant impact on the environment, you have to do an environmental document. And each agency within the federal government then sets the rules, regulations, on how you prepare that environmental document. And they have certain categories on what you do, and, and the, 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 the simplest one is called a categorical exclusion, the next one's called an EA, and the next one's called an environmental impact statement. But it's based on a major federal action. 
which the FAA has interpreted to mean a project. So any time you have a proposed project which the FAA would either fund or approve or permit, you have to go through NEPA in some way. Master plans being adopted by the local community do not have to go through NEPA. And the reason being is that the FAA only approves two things in a master plan. They don't approve the master plan. They accept the master plan. They approve the airport layout plan contingent upon NEPA, and they approve the forecasts. Say that again, please. I'm yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Can you say that again? I, I, I didn't. The, the, FAA, the FAA does not approve a master plan. The FAA accepts a master plan. They approve two elements of a master plan. One is the forecast. The other is the airport layout plan. And that's a set of drawings that, but that's approved contingent upon NEPA approval prior to project implementation. So you'll get approved airport layout plan that's contingent upon NEPA. Okay, a minute ago I talked about uh, how Congress um, impacted the local sponsor's ability to implement reasonable noise restrictions. And that all started, well, 1976, there's the aviation noise policy, but subsequent to that, in 1979, Congress passed what's called uh, the Aviation Noise and Safety Act of 1979. That promulgated a certain federal regulation. At the time, it was called FAR Part 150, which has now been codified in the Code of Federal Regulations. That particular statute uh, directed FAA to do three major things. One is determine and identify a noise metric to identify aircraft noise. It directed FAA then to identify a land use compatibility guideline. And it then directed FAA to determine what that noise metric is in relation to land use compatibility and determine the threshold for compatibility for noise abatement and noise mitigation purposes. And that particular set of guidelines is adopted by ed every federal agency that deals with aircraft noise, HUD, DOD, all, all the agencies that deal with that. So what does that mean? Well, you've got to put your common sense hat away and deal with what's not common sense. Because what that means is the metric that FAA was directed to develop for noise, for, no, for everything, noise evaluation, noise mitigation, is what's called the day-night noise level, the DNL noise level. And that is an average annual cumulative noise level, which you do not hear because it's an annual average cumulative noise level it's averaged over first a 24-hour period and then a 365-day period. And that particular metric is composed of a contour. And those noise contours are very similar to geographic contours. And they connect lines or points of equal energy, equal noise exposure. And the louder the uh, noise level, the higher the DNL level. 75 DNL is much higher than 65 DNL. The DNL also has a 10 decibel, what the, what the FAA calls penalty, or it's a 10 decibel addition to every aircraft operation that occurs during nighttime. And they've been kind enough to identify nighttime force. And that's 10 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. Now what's significant about that is in the decibel DNL metric, because it's logarithmic, every 10 decibel is like a doubling of the noise. Because noise is more intrusive at night than it is during the day. There's lower ambient levels, there's not as much noise, people are trying to sleep, and so that nighttime noise is more intrusive. And FAA has also directed that we have to use a particular computer model to generate those noise contours. And that's called the Aviation Environmental Design Tool. And so even though we have to do DNL, we also have to use a specific model to model those particular noise levels. 
And this is important because as we go through any planning process, we generate noise contours. And you have to realize that those noise contours are not going to be representative of what you hear. What you hear when an aircraft flies over your house is what's called a maximum noise level. But that maximum noise level is not exactly represented by the DNL noise level. And so even though you are outside the 65 DNL level, which is the threshold contour, it does not mean that you're not in experiencing intrusive noise levels on a single event basis. And that's important to know. <laughs> that's all I got. Can I ask some Thank questions? You. you can ask all you want. Yeah, okay. please. So, well, all your very helpful comments. Um, helicopters are a different story, right? Uh, yes and no. I mean, they are in the noise model. Okay. They have a different noise footprint, but they still meet all, they still uh, have all the other characteristics of, of fixed wing aircraft, except they got a whoop, 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 as opposed to the, the, the fixed wing sound. Right, and they can fly at much lower elevations than what an airplane can, is my understanding. That's correct. That's correct. All right. So my second question is about this National Environmental Policy Act. So if I understood you properly, um, will there be some kind of NEPA review at Maury Airport if uh, some plan goes forward? The, the, the process is that um, an airport sponsor requests funding to do an airport master plan. Oh, so the city of Middleton has to request funding. To do a, to do a master plan. Study. And then... Do they get some discretion as to what scope or uh, how detailed the study is, what it's studying? You mean the master plan? No, the environmental. Right. Well, yeah, let me, you, you, oh, okay. you didn't let me finish my project. So we do a master plan. The master plan then results in, through involvement and decision making, results in an airport layout plan and a capital improvements program. That capital improvements program will identify specific projects to be uh, funded and implemented on an airport. Then depending upon the type of project that is, if it's a fence, then you do a categorical exclusion prior to putting that fence in. If it's a runway extension, you do an environmental assessment prior to constructing that runway. But what do those words mean? What in the environment are they assessing? Will they assess the Okay, line? they, the, each, as I said, each federal agency develops its own rules, regulations, and in FAA's case, orders that uh, direct what environmental factors any environmental document has to evaluate and identifies thresholds that have to be exceeded to um, demand mitigation. And so there's a list of projects for a categorical exclusion. There's a list of projects for environmental assessment. There's a list of projects for EISs. And there's 23 or 24 environmental factors or resource categories that have to be evaluated. And that evaluation is a comparison of what would happen without the project compared to what would happen with the project. And normally that's done to, to look at the year of implementation plus five years after year of implementation. So I know this sound, it's very complicated, but how will this commit committee get more specific information? Let's just say hypothetically, if these potential projects move forward, what specifically, if any, environmental assessment is possible, and then if I understand your statements correctly, the city of Middleton has to f ask for funding for these specific, I mean, there's, there's a lot of. Right, there's a lot of, and, and, and it's, it, it's a step-by-step a -step process. You, as, as was stated earlier, the FAA will not grant federal funds unless you have an approved airport layout plan and capital improvements program that identifies certain projects. So that's the first step. Okay, and assuming that the FAA agrees to that and they, and they approve that contingent upon NEPA work, then 
the the bureau and the FAA get together and say, okay, we got X amount of dollars, and your priorities are A, B, C, D, E, F. We we can fund A, B, C if you submit an application to us to do that. But prior to that. You've also got to request funds to do an environmental document because we've got, we being the federal government, have got to approve that environmental documentation <coughs> before we grant you any funds. And in a lot of instances, that environmental documentation will require certain mitigation measures. And that's all got to be carried out prior to the, the project actually going into construction. So Does that make sense? Well, but I'm, asked, I'm trying to get some specifics, and I'm, you probably can't give me them. So I'm going to go to my last question. Uh, so if I understood the noise comments uh, properly, City of Middleton, Maury Airport has no ability to regulate noise at Maury Airport. That's almost true. And what's the almost part? The, the, the almost part is that if you had a DNL 65 noise contour over a significant number of non-compatible land uses. And generally that's residences, schools, libraries, uh, medical facilities, things like that. And you could not reduce that contour by any other means, then you could enter into what's called an FAR Part 161 study, which is a, which is a cost benefit study which compares the cost to the airport user to, to the benefits of the public. And if that cost benefit study comes out positive for the public, then you could implement regional noise regulations. And the reason I say it could, because the regulation the way it states today only addresses, and this is getting too complicated, stage two and stage three aircraft. All the stage three, all the stage two aircraft are out of the fleet. They're no longer flying. So all we have left is stage three aircraft for the regulation. However, all the, all the aircraft being manufactured at the end of next year are stage five, which is the quietest aircraft. We have most aircraft manufactured now are stage four. And so we've already gone through that quieter aircraft manufacturing and flying standpoint, and the regulation doesn't address those. And that's a gray area, which nobody has, has looked at yet. So that's why I say almost. So is that where the noise abatement procedures or policies associated with an airport, does that come from the NEPA evaluation? Normally not. Normally that comes from what's called a Part 150 study, the study I talked about there that's part of ASNA that F the Congress directed FAA to do. When you do a, a and that's a strictly a noise mitigation, noise abatement statute and regulation, and that directs a series of alternatives that some of those are flight tracks, some of them are just different procedures and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your overview. I really appreciated it. And I just want to ask a couple of follow-up questions. You talk about NEPA and every federal major, major federal action and every has, has to have an a, with a significant impact, has to prepare an environmental impact document. Each federal agency develops its own guidance. You've talked a lot about noise. Um, does the FAA require anything with respect to lead being put into the air by the overhead of small planes? Is there any studies that need to be done in, in within the context of this, for example, this proposed? expansion that may go into the revised master plan not in nepa what 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 faa will look at is in a forecasting scenario there's what we call unconstrained forecasts and constrained forecasts and if you have an aircraft which an airport which is constrained for whatever reason then it will look at at the airspace and how congested the airspace is for that constrained scenario. Now, the general rule of thumb is that a one runway airport that has either a partial or, or par full parallel taxiway will accommodate approximately 300 to 350,000 annual operations a year 
without being unduly constrained. Okay, and I, thank you. And I so, in other words, I don't think this this airport would ever come within a, the definition of constrained. Is that am I? I agree. Am I wrong about that? Okay. So there. So even though the small planes that are non-jet are putting are using leaded gasoline to fly, and it is out putting out lead and and it and we do know that it's very clearly established by the CDC and every reputable scientist that there is no safe exposure for children to lead. Mm. There's nothing that the FAA would do to prevent that. Is that correct? No, you, that's not. That's not the question you asked. Right. The question but I'm asked asking was asking now. I'm, okay, I'm right, yeah, up. exactly. Yeah, I'm following it up with another question. Right, sir. and and no, one of the 23 resource categories is air quality. <laughs> And so when you, you analyze air quality, you do computer modeling of what the future forecast level would be from an emission standpoint. And you, you do that emissions inventory and you do the calculations and you do a greenhouse gases inventory and, and you present all that information. Now, the, the kicker is, and where I've run into this the last five years, is that there's, the FAA does not recognize any, stand, any standards that tell you thresholds of exceedance for, either, for, for lead or greenhouse gases. So we do that evaluation and we present that information and that information then is given to the airport sponsor. The airport sponsor can always say, we're done with the environmental, we think there's too much environmental impact and we don't wanna go forward with the project. I'd just like to request that that be put into the minutes that there is no safe exposure for lead for children and and in this area where we get a lot of aircraft there are four or five small there are four or five schools for small children and I uh, you know I just want to point that out because there's no safe exposure for them the second thing I would like to can I can I follow up with one other question Please. related to this mm -hmm. NEPA I have been trying very hard to be conscientious and do my work, and I do have a follow-up question for you, so please bear with me. One of the things that I have been looking at very closely since I was asked to serve on this committee is fine particulate emissions. There is a lot of work coming out of California that suggests not just, of course, both jets and small planes put out fine particulate emissions, and the most recent research suggests that this has a very bad effect on children's asthma, elderly people with asthma, and I believe it's heart conditions, but don't quote me on that last one. So there's nothing in NEPA that addresses that, correct? And there's nothing in, that the FAA requires for that? Or am I just, I'm, I just am asking because I want to know. No, that's a, confu very, that's a confusing issue. The, the, the air quality evaluation in NEPA does require us to disclose particulates. Fine particulates Yes, well? that's, that's, but... That's all we do is disclose it yes. because there's no there's threshold no standard. standard. Threshold that's, that's correct. Been set yet. That's, that's correct. correct. Okay, thank and you. And Julie, that goes as far as 10 miles out to yes. find particulates in a new study out of an airport in LAX, so it's not just right immediately at the airport. No, it goes in a very, they can go in very wide plumes, and that's why I am very, I, I want to follow up on that, and I'm asking that question. Yeah, the, the, I don't have the expertise. The, the model that, the, the dispersion model we use is the same, it's the same model it models noise so it's consistent from a noise standpoint and from an emission standpoint and depending on all that's dict all that is is dictated by the flight tracks where the aircraft fly what altitude they're at and all those things so it's going to vary from airport to airport but that's the information that goes in there sir can i ask about the environmental assessment if we get one and what it would look like sure. the, the floodplain. i mean yes. that's a sensitive and then it was just gentleman from Springfield here, but uh, the environmental corridor around the airport is uh, very sensitive. I just read a short bit, but you can jump in, uh, where it said that the city's water recharge is there, so it really needs to stay functioning as it is. I mean, would an environmental assessment look at any of that? Yes. Does DNR get involved? I yes. Mean, is that, again, discretionary up to the city of Middleton as to how much or what they do, if anything? No, it's not. Anytime you get into NEPA, that is not discretionary on the sponsor. That is a federal document, federal regulation, federal requirements. Now, <clears throat> as some of you all probably know, NEPA is a procedural act. It's not a substantive statute. 
it's procedure and it and it calls out the process and procedure that you have to go through within NEPA you have to address the substantive statutes endangered species uh, air quality water quality uh, um, you know the <clears throat> historic preservation act all those substantive statutes are addressed within the procedural statute of NEPA and so if there's a floodplain issue we address you know the floodplain guidelines if there's a, a wetlands issue we address the wetlands if there's now <clears throat> where there's a lot not a lot where there can be some um, discrepancies is that NEPA does not really recognize a state identified species it only deals with the federal identified species so if you have an area <coughs> excuse me which is natural or has state species in it a state interest or state concern all they will do is to disclose that and say that's here but they won't address that from a threshold standpoint oh, just, may I do one more? Yeah, please. so uh, in the environmental assessment uh, we are known in the town of Middleton and probably the town of Springfield for all our amazing migratory birds and wildlife and I know at the airport that's an extreme hazard how so do you have to eradicate all the wildlife at the airport or I mean do you just can you talk about that a little bit yeah now <laughs> now now you are looking at um, a different planning document that addresses wildlife hazards specifically and that's called a wildlife hazard mitigation study and that is a, a specific study which looks at wildlife induced hazards to aircraft approaching and departing an airport and even the the, the NEPA document will say okay there's you know there, there's a migratory route here we've had six bird strikes in the last 20 years whatever it may be that will be disclosed but then another document will be prepared because when you're dealing with migratory species and all those other types of issues, you really are dealing with something within the purview of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Agriculture, which, which helps and has to be a part of any type of wildlife mitigation study you do. That's not a standalone FAA document that's in partnership with Fish and Wildlife. If I could make two comments. One, I think it's very important that we note in the minutes the requirements of NEPA that no project will go forward without that and that it is not discretionary by the city. It's going to happen. The second thing is we do not do any lethal, uh, uh, how did you describe it, uh, destroying? The, uh, there's no shooting that goes on on the airport property. Uh, what we do do is haze the, air, the birds that are a problem. Uh, generally speaking, they're ring neck gulls. We send a M80 in their direction, it makes a bang, and they laugh at us. And then the second one, they usually fly off the runway. Uh, we so add, hazing means making noise? It, yeah, I'm sorry. It's a, a small explosive device powered by a blank uh, pistol that goes approximately 100 feet into the air. And when I was a kid, we referred to the explosive charge in it as an M80, which it's bigger than a firecracker, let's put it that way. Um, so there is no, nothing is killed out there unless it's hit by an airplane. Um, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? Please. Who has uh, jurisdiction over the, does the FAA overrule everybody or is the DNR <coughs> on equal footing with the FAA when it comes to stuff like uh, water retention and Who's got the final say? Are you asking from a NEPA standpoint or from a permit yes, standpoint? Any standpoint, especially with water retention. Okay, it's um, the FAA has certain policies about how how much water can be retained, to, uh, depending upon how close it is to an airport, and so there are FAA regulations, and then there are state regulations. Um, and that's a good question because it, it kind of depends on, on what the particular issue is and what particular state you're in on how that's addressed. Some states are not very aggressive in that sort of thing, and so they don't even bother, and the FAA takes full responsibility for over all that. In other states, they're, they are more aggressive on that, and they take a bigger role in that, and then a lot of times that's shared. Well, my question pertains to if, there's a water problem. Everybody knows there's a water problem in Middleton. 
So I have heard that you want to do retention pond in Springfield, some land or whatever. If that comes in effect, water attracts birds, lots of birds, a lot of geese around here. <laughs> A lot of geese hunters right out there on Schneider Road, so as you I probably know. Them. So that's why I'm trying to find out who's going to have the final say when it comes to a major hazard that birds can cause to plants. In, in my experience, again, I, I talked about the FAA has certain regulations about, and we'll just call it a wildlife attractant. And that can be water, that can be wetlands, that can be a garbage dump, that can be landfills, that can be a transfer station. Um, <clears throat> we have one airport that we're working with, or it's a golf course. The golf course attracts geese, and you get all kinds of problems there. <laughs> the, the FAA will, uh, in the environmental document, will look at how far that attractant is from the runway. And that may influence whether they will grant or modify whatever project there is um, if that wildlife hazard cannot be mitigated. Sometimes mitigation is nets over ponds, um, things of that nature, so that, so that birds can't land or nest there. Okay. One question I was going to ask you, is there a 150 pl uh, plan that's going to be implemented as part of this master plan? I seriously doubt that FAA would even give that any consideration whatsoever simply because there's not enough traffic to generate a contour large enough to encompass um, any uh, what we'll call noise sensitive uses. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I, I wanted to just ask a question of Maiden Hunt and, and um, the planning staff as well. Right now we're, we're visiting the, we're, we're discussing the regulatory environment as we discuss the plan as it's developed, will we be returning to these issues? Because as you can probably tell, public health is of extreme importance to me. And I don't know, is this the only time we're gonna be talking about these things? Just a question. Well, and it, I, I have to ask you guys because I, yeah, I, mean, I if, know if, we don't have that plan that was up that first meeting to look at the meeting schedule and everything. If you do, these, these are environmental issues and those are addressed in a NEPA document from a, an evaluation standpoint, they would be disclosed as part of the concerns in a master planning process. And that should be taken into the decision-making process of what you want to do, uh, what, this, what this airport sponsor as wants develop, to do. As we develop the plan, as, we de as this plan is developed, we need to take those concerns into Correct, order. or not developed. I mean, the, you know, right. like, like we say, it could be, right. I've done a lot of airports where it's Thank status quo. Got it. Okay, thank you. You know, just because you're doing a master plan does not automatically mean you're going to expand the airport or anything like that. Thank you. Okay. Does the advisory committee have any more uh, questions relative to regulatory environment at this point in time? No, I'd just like to thank you for a very good uh, explanation of the process. It's the best I've ever heard. <laughs> Thank you. I've done this once or twice. <laughs> and it's clear as mud, I know. Okay. With that, we will open it to the public to comment on any regulatory environment uh, comments that they would like to make. It is now 8 o'clock. We will close this at 8.15. So is there anybody that would like to make comments? Please. Come on up, give us your name, address. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jenny Pavlovic, 4646 Hawthorne Court, Town of Middleton. Um, I just, I started thinking about this another way um, when we were getting the regulatory information and I'm wondering if it's possible that we might use the updated master plan for the airport as a way to address increases in noise and decreases in air quality over the last 20 years without um, considering an expansion. I know the expansion is still going to be considered, but maybe it's possible to actually use this since we haven't done any planning for the airport for 20 years to address changes that have already occurred. 
Thank you. Anyone else? I do have a question. Um, does the FAA, in reviewing any documents, look at what kind of uh, compatibility land planning has going on? For example, around the airport, there's quite a number of residential developments. Now, the airport's been here for a while, planning's been here for a while, but we still keep building residential facilities in the flight path. And I don't know if FAA looks at that and says, no, you know, uh, the planning there wasn't so good. And does that enter into any comments they might make, or do they stay out of that? The, um, the FAA will consider that definitely when there is a noise contour that uh, <coughs> impacts or affects that planning. The FAA does not have any control over local uh, planning or zoning, and they leave that up to the local unit of government to to do something about. So that's not in their jurisdiction. Um, one of the grant assurances that the sponsor agrees to is to try and influence compatible land use planning and zoning to the extent that they can. Now, a lot of times, especially in a situation like this, where you have the airport sponsor in one jurisdiction and surrounded by other jurisdictions, then th that type of planning is outside the control of the airport sponsor unless they are in a state that, that allows that to happen. Well, except for a situation where we have a community, we have a planning department, we have an airport, uh, an airport exists, we keep building residential in the flight path even, close to the airport. Me, I think the proper word is cockamamie. Uh, you know, why is this being done? We knew the airport was here. We know it disturbed residences. But yeah, we keep filling in. Um, we keep zoning. We're still maybe residential within the uh, flight path area. Seems to me, a lot of words you can to describe it, but I, um, I can't think of any that are polite at this point. Well, let me, uh, the FAA is not this is again, remember I said you got to put your common sense hat down. Um, from a flight track, flight path standpoint, the FAA is not concerned about what's beneath that flight track unless it is close to or within a designated noise contour or within certain other dimensional requirements at an airport like a runway protection zone and, and things like that. They do have what's called FAR, Federal Aviation Regulation, Part 77, which is guidance to the local community to address hazards and obstructions. But the FAA does not enforce that because they don't have that power that's vested in the local unit of government. <coughs> so that's, that's something they will look at and that is something they encourage the local sponsor to adopt, but that's as far as it goes. Yeah, give that common sense hat over to our local government Yes, I mean that's 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 what that's who's in charge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I, yep. Yep. Just I, go, go, get her. go ahead. Um, yep. Thank you, um, Kyle Larson. Do you want my address again, Mark? Okay. Um, so you said that the environmental concerns that we were discussing, that I think NEPA mm -hmm. would, would be addressing, um, those are the concerns that this committee is supposed to be addressing. And I'm just wondering what kind of resources the committee will have access to to address those concerns for the noise. Um, again, I, one of my main concerns is the schools in the area. I've got two young children who go to the schools in the area um, and who already have planes flying over them all the time. It's disruptive to their learning with the lead over there. But what kinds, with the water tables we're talking about. And when I spoke with Mead and Hunt earlier, the answer that I got was that you would be looking at existing research. I'm just wondering how you're going to present that to the committee, what that research is, where you're gathering it from, basically how, how the committee is going to inform their opinion about it. Thank you. Yeah, I guess in, in a general way, the, the, the effort environmentally speaking for this master plan is to do an environmental inventory of existing conditions and I, I think this was something we had touched on a little bit um, at the open house but we are going to be looking at what you know through existing mapping and through existing informations what the environment 
uh, conditions are. You know, there's existing wetland mapping, there's existing floodplain mapping. Um, we're going to be pulling all of that information in as part of the inventory effort. Um, we are not going to be getting into the next step, like like uh, Rick was talking about, which is the NEPA process, where a more you know project by project, there's a, a, a pretty detailed evaluation on an environmental level. What we're doing on a master plan level is inventorying what's out there, and that's certainly going to be consideration with any alternatives of are we impacting wetlands, are we impacting floodplain if we take a, a runway a certain direction, um, and, and comparing that against a do-nothing alternative too, you know. Um, but that is what this level of environmental analysis includes in the master plan, an inventory of existing things that are out there, known listed species, known wetlands, known floodplains. We're not doing any um, mapping or new analysis. We're relying on what information is already known. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Other, we got a, we have a com committee member. Go ahead. Who determines the flight path? And like how far does the plane have to, to turn by the time it leaves the runway? That is in a controlled environment, that is the FAA tower oh aha, thank you in a controlled environment that's the the FAA tower folks when it's a controlled environment in a non-towered uncontrolled environment like this there are um, uh, regulations that talk about altitude where you're supposed to be and uh, then there's proper flying techniques so again once the airplane leaves the ground FAA has total control does uh, Dane County monitor the planes that take off on radar, or there's no radar coverage from Middleton? Uh, I can address that perhaps a little better. Uh, they, the Madison radar can see our aircraft in their pattern. They can or can? I'm they sorry. can, for the most part. Uh, it would, uh, I believe, on short final and on, uh, on the ground and on short takeoff, they cannot. But for the most part, they can. Uh, you can also go on uh, flight aware, and if the aircraft, you know, the registration number and it has uh, the ADSB out, you can, it creates a track. Now, Middleton Municipal Airport, Maury Field, has modified and adopted a noise abatement procedure that my father developed when Hickory Woods was first uh, built in order to, uh, if we would follow the regulations in the pattern, we'd be flying at a low altitude at full power over residential areas. Instead, we now turn to approximately a 300 degree heading if we're taking off to the west on runway 28. We will continue up to, and this is only, this has no teeth, this is voluntary. We will continue up to pattern altitude. We will throttle back and then turn the crosswind. We have a upwind leg, crosswind, downwind base, and final, if you can imagine a big rectangle around an aircraft, around the airport, uh, with one leg being the runway. Uh, this has been studied twice by the FAA from concerned citizens who were uh, wondering about it. Uh, both times uh, they have said that we are going beyond anything that the regulations require to minimize the footprint that is on the uh, on the neighbors. Now, if you take off to the east, again, you would, if you follow the FAA regulations, you'd be climbing <clears throat> right out over residential areas along Branch Street, um, or not Branch Street, excuse me, Century Avenue. We recommend that we turn over the highway, as, and that's lower than the FAA requires, or actually even recommends, and then follow that highway corridor out, which is already rather noisy, and then turning at a, a reasonable altitude to the downwind leg. So those, uh, they've been studied. They are voluntary. There is no teeth to them. But it is, it is standard operating procedure for aircraft who can safely comply with them, and that means of a certain airspeed and size at the airport. Uh, my flight school and my people follow them almost, uh, well, Every, occasionally people goof up, but for the most part, we follow them religiously. I would just like to comment, and I don't know 100%, Rich, and I don't know when that's, those studies were done, but I think that where you're doing this turning to the west, I think there's a whole bunch of houses there now, so maybe you relieved the noise for some group of houses some years ago, but you've now created it for another additional group of houses. 
because all of that, especially the training, the touch and goes, is going over the same bunch of houses over and over and over again. So it would be nice if we could study that again. We often get the argument that we should fly over someone else's house. Yeah. I, it's a congested area. <clears throat> it should be a higher than 500 feet altitude. Go ahead. I, I want, is it all right if I follow up to something that Greg of Mead and Hunt said? Sure. Somebody had asked him about the scope of environmental studies, and you, if I understand you correctly, you said you're doing an inventory of what's currently operating there. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah, we okay. are, so, yep. So what I want to ask and follow up with with the planning staff and with the committee is, what is keeping, I understand it's not within the scope of your service from what you've just said, but, but I don't understand why we would be putting options on the table without considering, we as a committee, not Mead and Hunt, but we as a committee considering their, their environmental impacts, the water issues, which I have, Dan knows I sit in the Springfield Town Board of Meetings as a, trying to be a quiet listener, but I have heard them discuss in a very careful fashion these issues and I don't think they're going to go away. I'm very interested as are some of the other moms in this air in this group and probably the dads too about the public health impacts of an, of some of these options. And you're telling me you guys can't do it, but is there anything keeping us from talking about them because I don't see how we should be putting those things in a master plan without opening the, this up, it gets back to that question about what kind of research are we relying on as we go forward. And I have heard nothing about that, and it is a really genuine question that I have. Thank you. I don't know if there's an answer at this point in time. Um, go ahead. Uh, could I just have a clarification? Because you seem to think that it's wet in the summer as it is in the winter time. How do you handle it at the, at the present time if your runway is wet? Sure. So I, I didn't necessarily say that it's as wet in the summer as the winter, but I did want to mm -hmm. clarify that the summer operations or any But you made the relationship. That's why I, I wanted a clarification. If it's, if it's wet in the summertime, how do you handle it? Uh, well, in the, the current aircraft that we operate, it's not a problem with, with the airport. So even if it's wet, it's not a problem. Snow is a different case. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. And the way it's handled generally is if there is a, a aircraft that it needs an uncontaminated runway, that is something that's dry in order for its insurance company to validate this as a legal landing spot, as in they're going to cover it, because the, the world is actually ruled by insurance companies, sorry, I don't, aviation world is, versus actual you know, performance standards. They want a safety margin. They go to Madison and they land. Uh, that's how that's handled. Well, that's what I was wondering, we are, we are still close to Madison, but 12 miles? Nine miles, yes. Nine miles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Win you. Winter has many challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Can we circle and back to the question that I asked? Is there something that's preventing us from doing this? I want to talk about it in re with respect to the regulatory um, impacts because I don't know when else it's going to come up in this meeting. And I do think that's why a lot of people are here and there's some genuine concern a as we've heard over and over again from people. I'll take a shot at this. Um, the master plan is going to do an in, uh, environmental inventory of conditions. That inventory will presumably flag the various issues that are in place around the airport that are affecting the airport. Air quality, noise, wetlands, migratory birds, all those things are going to be um, listed and, and mentioned. At that point, if the com committee wishes to have additional discussion and, and investigate those things, there's absolutely no reason why you can't have that discussion. Great, thanks. So, but again, we are trying to get to that point, and I'm we don't have all the I answers don't, now. I, don't, so. I didn't know how that right. was to be addressed, so thank you. Yep. Good. Any other 
I actually had a question too, if you, if you would indulge me, it's related to one of the things he said, and since we have this resource here from Oklahoma Absolutely. today. Um, Rick, you mentioned something about some states, that different states have different, uh, have to give local jurisdictions different level of authorization um, for regulating land use as in response to Mr. Bartholomew's question. Uh, are you familiar with Wisconsin at all specifically? And if not, Greg can maybe address no. this. The question <laughs> I'm specifically asking is, um, it's my understanding the city of Middleton as a sponsor, just like any airport sponsor in Wisconsin, does have some um, um, Jurisdic ability to regulate land uses in proximity to the airport, possibly even adopting certain zoning classifications or classifications, uh, zoning laws. <laughs> and I'm just curious um, if, the, yeah, no, I think that's something the master plan should also need, uh, address. And uh, I think and, it will address from talking with Greg. I just wanted to make sure that that's mentioned. And, and Rick handed the mic here. This is by no means my uh, area of expertise, right. but um, there are statutes in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a state that has statutes that does grant uh, airport owners the ability to implement um, zoning restrictions within a three mile, as Mark said, within a three mile distance of the airport boundary. Um, and the Wisconsin Bureau of Aeronautics has developed a compatible land use guidebook that, that talks about uh, some of the benefits and values of developing a compatible land use plan in an airport zoning district around an airport. It's not a requirement, but it is something that is highly recommended. And the State Bureau of Aeronautics will fund uh, up to, I believe, $50,000 uh, the implementation of a uh, zoning ordinance um, if it's actually carried forward and adopted and it needs to be adopted um, by an ordinance it isn't just something the city can implement so, so would yeah. that be the city of Middleton adopting a zoning ordinance in a three mile radius the, yeah the the but airport sponsor but isn't yeah. some of that three mile radius include the town of Middleton and the town right. of it does right. it does so what is the what's the arrangement for handling that um, it, because I know we have an intergovernmental agreement that I think I, I was going to ask a follow-up question anyway, that where there are where there are some there's some language that Springfield is trying to protect some interests and Middle City of Middleton is trying to protect some interests. How does that work vis-a-vis -vis this three-mile zoning? Yeah, and you know I think the uh, the folks that would um, support the implementation of it would be looking at at all all those different regions and we've developed one recently in La Crosse uh, that's an airport that sits on the border that zoning ordinance spans two states it spans I believe four counties uh, uh, like eight towns um, so it's it's looking at all those municipalities in in concert so they all uh, signed on to it is that what you're saying that was some kind of intergovernmental agreement to do that it, it the and again I'm, I'm speaking out of my area of expertise here I would just say that there are uh, Wisconsin is a state that has these um, abilities for airport sponsors to implement these zoning laws. And I'm not sure every community needs to be on board with it, um, but it is a, a tool. Um, Julie, I, I, can, I think we can try and get a little bit further with this in a, as a response. I attended a Town of Middleton board meeting on Monday because this specifically was on the agenda. And since we have the town chairwoman here, maybe she can share what the town board discussed with their attorney. Sure, and actually, um, if I had known that Mark was going to come to our meeting, I could have told him what we were going to do. Uh, we had had an earlier discussion about our statutory tenure comprehensive plan update, which we're in the middle of and we're doing citizen surveys, but unfortunately because of the timing of this airport issue, didn't really segue with it because the survey was already done and out. Uh, but by way of file, so when the board was looking at that, they asked about incorporation because that comes up quite a fair amount these days. Uh, because we don't really want to be annexed in out of existence as a town. Uh, and so our town attorney had addressed it several, uh, one or two meetings earlier, but in the context of other things as well. And so I put it specifically on the agenda Monday because she had said that even if we incorporate uh, all of the legal authorities in the city of Middleton's hands, we, we, did, we can't do anything. It, incorporation would not help us in any way, shape, or form with regard to an airport expansion at Maury. So that was the only reason that was on the agenda. And to elaborate, it's not unique to the city of Middleton. This is any sponsor of any airport. Right. Uh, in fact, the attorney, uh, Eileen, said something interesting at that meeting, which I was surprised to hear, and I, didn't follow, I haven't followed up, but she even 
has made some comment about private airports have some authority, which absolutely surprises me. But we don't need, it's not germane for this discussion because it's not a private airport. But it's just, you know, I, I, was, I have a sincere interest in this question too, and that's why I thought it was interesting to hear the response. Um, I would add that the city of Middleton, and I can speak based on our adopted policies, we have a long standing relationship with the town of Middleton that predates me and predates uh, Chair. And very positive. It, it's very positive, absolutely. We have no intent to annex to the west without the agreement of the town of Middleton. We don't, you know, we've had discussions as it relates to the, uh, the Erdman parcel from time to time and then in the Blackhawk, you know, that area by the quarry, but we have never uh, sought to annex uh, west of the existing boundary in, in Middleton, north of Highway 14. Um, Are you thinking uh, again per agreement? Yeah, no, no. But these retention ponds that Dan mentioned, would those go in the town of Springfield land, and then would you annex it? Would you take I, it by? Oh, you would do it by purchase. I'm sorry, I. I I'm, I'm not sure what Supervisor uh, Drazen or Drazen, how do you say it? Drazen, excuse me, um, it, uh, specifically was referring to, but there has been, as a result of the flood last August 20th, there has been extensive discussion in the metro area about how can we make ourselves more resilient to flooding, uh, making sure we don't have as much damage again. One of the ideas, of course, has been to retain water upstream of communities that it could damage. And I think that is what Supervisor Drazen is referring to, is that there have been some ideas, no formal proposals that I'm aware of, but there's been the idea of looking upstream from Middleton, we have the city of Madison to the south, and there's a lot of developed land there, not much room for stormwater infiltration, although there are opportunities, and, and our mayor's working with Madison on that. Um, and then in the town of Springfield, there's a lot of farmland, um, which uh, is not obviously developed, so in theory, there's a lot of opportunity for infiltration. So I, I'm not sure how to answer your question other than there's just been these discussions. The airport, one of the reasons the city purchased the airport, there were several key reasons. One of them was so that it wouldn't become a business park. It was actually proposed when it was privately owned by the Mori family, by Field Mori. They had not an option or an offer, accepted offer, from Robert Bletner, the developer, to turn that into a business park with sewer and water laterals at the town of Springfield. One of the reasons we got into the airport business was so that we would have an open area, largely open area, and allow stormwater management infiltration. And during that flood, I went out there. Actually, we had an airport commission meeting that night, ironically. It was a uh, it, it uh, <laughs> very heavy rain. And um, that airport actually helped if you will, save some of the flooding. Um, it helps store some of the flood water. Obviously still tremendous tragic damage. So um, we're very concerned about stormwater in the city. We're concerned about all the environmental impacts. I can assure you that those things are all going to be studied as we go through if we decide to go forward with any project. Well, if you extend the runway though, there's more paved surface, less chance for absorption into the ground, right? App, if you, there, there's no denying that. Yeah, okay. Sure. So, but that may create more flooding problems. If you if you add uh, hypothetically a thousand feet to a runway that's a hundred feet wide, that's ten thousand square feet. Uh, the size of a lot is more than ten thousand square feet. Yeah. So it of course is everything's incremental, but any time you add a roof to a house, uh, the the inf the effect of adding a house in the city of Middleton or in the town of Springfield or town of Middleton, the effect of adding a small subdivision of five houses or ten houses is going to have more of an impact on impervious surface area than a, a little addition to the runway. And I'm not saying that to justify the runway. I want to emphasize that. I did want to say one thing um, in response to an earlier question. I put up a map here that shows um, distances from the airport from each end of the runway. And I think there's been a lot of concern, rightfully so, understandably so, uh, about aircraft noise and how it affects the west end of the airport, the town of Middleton and town of Springfield. And if you look at the population to the west, all of, you know, many of whom are, have expressed concern, the population to the east is, you know, much greater, and those people are also going to have the same concern, in theory. So this idea that, you know, the city hasn't, isn't concerned about noise because it only affects rural areas, um, I think is what I'm trying to suggest here is that there are a large number of people to the east of the airport that also have a stake in noise. That's all I wanted to point out. Thank you, Mark. 
Any other questions from the audience relative to regulatory environment? Seeing none, we'll move on to the forecast summary. All right, thank you. Um, it's been a little bit since the last meeting, so just as a refresher for everybody, we're just going to do a quick summary of the forecast, um, just so it's uh, fresh in everybody's mind. Here we are. So first off, just like Rick said, purpose of the forecast is that in the master plan, it is one of two things that must be approved by the FAA. So this is something that the FAA actually has to see and sign off on. Um, so th that's the purpose of the forecast in the master plan. Um, and the other reason that it is included and very foundational is that when we come up with these projections, these are what's used to put plans on paper. You have to have, if you're going to create a plan, you need to know what you're planning for. So just as a recap, we're going to kind of go down at the top. It's probably a little harder to see on the screen, but that is the base aircraft forecast. Now, Middleton is actually in a unique position because they have a very long waiting list. Normally, what we see in the industry is that things are tending to move towards more turbine aircraft because flying is expensive. And so because flying is expensive, fewer recreational pilots can afford it. Therefore, it's a little more business oriented than it used to be and single aircraft are becoming less common. However, with Middleton, that does not apply as much because there is this waiting list of people that are interested in having a hangar on the airport. So right now there are 94 aircraft and that's projected to go up to 140. And again, this is over the next 20 years and it's not saying this is guaranteed. This is looking at possibilities. So because this is a waiting list, um, what we could probably expect to happen is that there would not be incremental growth up to that 139. 139. Yeah, it's hard to see. Um, 139. Instead, there'd be kind of an initial influx as availability is made uh, well available, as hangers are made available. So more people will come in initially, and then that growth would taper off and return to more national trends. So you can see this in the next chart down below, which is the fleet mix. Again, Middleton being kind of in a unique position because the, uh, if you can, oh, there it is. The jet, which is the light blue, what would be more typical, there's you know gonna be an increase over the next 20 years, which is likely just because it's more common in the industry right now, but it's not as big of a proportion as we would probably expect it to be at another airport of this size because of, again, about that waiting list. There are people who already want to come to this airport that have single engine aircraft. So we're actually going to see a larger rise in small aircraft here in Middleton than we would in a similar airport somewhere else in the country that doesn't have these constraints. So finally, we have our operations forecast. Now, this kind of ties back to the based aircraft forecast because if you have that sudden uptick in uh, based aircraft and then tapering off over time, it's reasonable to expect that that would also be reflected as a, in operations. Those aircraft are going to come in and they're going to do something. They're going to start flying. And so that initial uptick would mimic the uptick that you see in the base aircraft and then taper off again, starting to follow more regional and national trends as you go over time. Could you, for the benefit of the committee and the audience, just define what an operation is? Sure, thank you. That's a good question. So an operation is either one takeoff or one landing. So if you fly into Middleton and you have a lunch or something and then you fly out, that'd be two operations. Ask in the B-2 design group, which is the critical aircraft uh, planning is around, can every airplane today in the B-2 grouping land and take off in a 4,000 foot runway? I wouldn't, I mean, it, all right, so when you take an aircraft off, um, when you're conducting a takeoff with an aircraft, there are a lot of dependencies. First off, you're gonna have weight. So B-2, um, it's not restricted by weight. So you could have a B-2 aircraft that's much heavier, but it's still a B-2 aircraft. If it's a very hot day, performance from an aircraft is also um, far less effective. And then if the runway is wet or slick, that can also make it more difficult. Okay, but typical sure. operating conditions. Typically, um, it would vary generally more, more could than couldn't but it would vary depending on the aircraft. Where does one get a descriptive of all of the B-2 airplanes today in existence and what the length of the runway they need 
under normal conditions sure. take off and land. The FAA has a database that you can actually look at that downloads, or excuse me, you can download a database from the FAA that shows, I mean, obviously it's not every single aircraft, but it's pretty close. It's a very all-encompassing list and shows what categorization each of those aircraft fall under. Could that be included in the master plan as information? Uh, appendix or something? Yeah, as an appendix. Sure. sure. Okay. I, I would actually like to request that it be included in the next week that we, you send that to I me. I was just going to add. Yes, right. I because I have I have looked for it myself, and I think I found it. But um, I would like to see it, and that's something that we can we should be able to get quickly. Sure. And I'll send a link out during the open house that we had. We did have on that critical aircraft slide. We showed several common examples. I mean, there's there's quite an extensive list of B two aircraft. Some are far more common than others. King Air being a good example. So some of the most common we did have um, on that slide, but we can certainly make that available. From my perspective, the forecast looked very depressing. Uh, we got more aircraft, more noise, more potential pollution, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, from my perspective, as at least as a citizen, aside from my role here on the board, it doesn't look good. Um, well, for the forecast, again, this is something that the FAA does have to look at and approve. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I'm just yeah. going to give my opinion. Um, it's not something that looks encouraging as far as quality of life here. Do you have a specific question in there as no, well, or just general comment? comment? Sure. We're getting more noise, more aircraft flying more frequently and more hours of the night. And if you're getting more pollution, if you're getting more this and that, it doesn't sound like getting improve the quality of life in Middleton, Springfield, town of Middleton, whatever. I mean, actually, you know, didn't the city of Middleton make Madison, uh, the mag what was the magazine where top place to live in the country? Uh, I, I just would like us to ground this whole conversation in the backdrop of we are living in a highly desirable area and slowly, incrementally, it is being eroded, the reasons we live in this vicinity. Now, some will stay here regardless because they have jobs, et cetera. But I just fear that we are slowly but surely taking away something that's really invaluable and really very high quality of life related. <coughs> I agree, but I have a follow-up question to one of the of the of the presentation. When you talk about the forecast, you don't address whether I don't know if you had that kind of specificity in what you were looking at. Are those people who live in Middleton who you foresee um, seeking those hangars? Or are you talking about people who are coming, say, from across from Lake Mendota or elsewhere? Because, you know, this is a community of citizens and residents who live here, as opposed to having people coming in and finding it very desirable for their purposes, but they're not really, they're not really hometown Middleton people. And that, I do wonder about that a little bit. Yes, I understand this is, this is quite a separate discussion from economics because I understand we're not getting into that. But I'm a little concerned about that and I've been wondering about it for a long time and I'm gonna, t I mean, I'm gonna relay this story. Our son is doing a research year and he, I am going to say that he works with a student, uh, another person who is a student at Maury, and he said, you know, there are people who hop in their planes from and fly across Lake Mendota because they don't want to drive. Now, I'm sorry, but I have a little issue with that kind of usage of an airport when there are a lot of citizens and residents who seem a little upset, to put it mildly, about the idea of an increase. So I just want to have it out there. Who are these people that you're forecasting are coming? Do you know where their geographic location or anything? I know that was a really long question and it had a comment. But I just, I really am I really am curious about that. Sure, I can kind of address that. Um, so first off, there is the existing waiting list, like we mentioned, um, as far as how much that varies. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. That's certainly something we could look at. Can you come but, back to me with that, please? Yeah, I can tell you that the specifics of the forecast, though, when we're looking at that growth over time, particularly later in the forecast, when we're matching national... I'm sorry, uh, particularly what? I didn't hear the last Particularly thing. later in the oh, forecast, later. like towards the sorry. end of the forecast. Sorry, yeah. I didn't care. Sorry, it's a little echoey. Um, but towards the end of the forecast, we are following national trends and regional trends, and so that's not going to be tied to specific people. 
But could you get back to me with the stuff that you've got that's more in the near future? Sure. We can look at that. Thank you. And these are estimates, right? Uh, for the forecast numbers? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That means it could be more rather than less, more than your estimate. I mean, it, it's true. We're, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I could predict the future. Yeah, well, sure. But yeah. But what I'm um, getting at is that means we actually could have more aircraft, more noise, more flights than what's being estimated. Sure, and that's actually one of the reasons that we try not to take an overly conservative forecast because then your planning would be uh, less useful. And we could also right, have could be less, more, could be less. Right? Yeah, certainly. It could also be less interest. It's a forecast. Right. Well, we have all those people coming in from those seven or eight other states. So we'll probably have more. Maybe. Okay. Or maybe okay. we have less. Okay. Is there anything more that the committee would like to discuss? Uh, we do have some more to the forecast. I was. Let's, let's Mr. continue Chair. on. All right. Yeah, and just real quickly, we wanted to talk about the, the jet operations because I know that's been a, a, of a particular. Uh, discussion point and concern and just wanted to look over the past decade of how the jet operations at Maury have, have averaged and you can see this chart is showing um, operations up and down uh, but by and large about 650 jet operations a year is is the average you see some higher and some lower uh, we did talk with rich about you know what was sort of generating some of those ups and downs and they have had folks that were based uh, had a jet base there um, they've since left so they've had some in and out of, of folks who own jets um, and you can see that uh, 2010 was the kind of the peak in the past decade where they were uh, just over 900 jet operations um, in, a year. In, in a year. And, and so again, getting back to the fact that an operation is one takeoff or one landing, um, if you're talking about 650 operations over a year, um, say you had 10 operations a week, you're talking 500 uh, in a year. So we're, we're probably talking, you know, um, a couple operations um, by a jet, you know, um, a day or, or a little bit more than that looking at um, projections of jet operations and again this is in the forecast and, and the forecasts have been submitted to the FAA we're waiting on approval um, we're hoping to get that soon um, what we are seeing is uh, Middleton has a, a certain percentage of the national jet operations this is the the preferred forecast method that we've submitted um, and what we've done is sort of tied the FAA's national projections of jet operations to Middleton, saying that percentage would stay. And you can see, you know, the peak back in 2010 was just over 900. We're showing that by 2030, uh, 2032, that we'd be around that peak that they had in 2010, um, closer to the outlying years, you know, eclipsing 1,000 jet operations. The one thing we really want to preface with any of this is it's all contingent on runway length. So if you if you maintain, um, oh, run out of battery here. Um, I could plug this in. So just to just to have that sort of preface that you know, and again, we are going to be looking at runway length. Um, but it, obviously, if you have longer runway length, you are making jets more accessible, and and you can see these numbers change. And it's that constrained versus unconstrained forecast that that Rick was alluding to earlier. So Leif, I think that's what we wanted to just sort of recap on the. Uh, projections I'll, I'll turn it back for for public questions okay thank you any other it's on this side. Sorry to dig in your questions from oh, the no. yeah. are those projections Maybe? based on the airport as it is or after an expansion oh, yeah a good question. It, it really is uh, as as conditions are now um, we did um, yeah, that, that's that's the that's a good question. Oh, okay. yep. yep. projected as it says right as it is right now. Okay. Right. Okay. I, how are we going to fit up another 50 aircraft onto that field unless we have a, a di expansion with the hangars? Sorry. Yes, that is kind of the exception there. Okay. Um, yeah, that does assume there is space for those aircraft to come in. Okay. For which one? I'm sorry. For the jet operations? Is that? No, I was I'm talking sorry, based aircraft. aircraft. Oh, based. I'm based sorry, aircraft. Yeah. We're pretty much full You're up. Full. So how many Not new complete, hangers? But full up. So that gets back to a different slide. Sorry. Oh, that there's even a decision on that. But yeah. Well, I mean, but these are assumptions, right? And you said we need more hangers to. Right. I maybe I can restate for the minutes. I think I what I heard and what I wrote down. What I'm hearing is that these numbers are based on 
comparable airport mix of traffic for, for comparable airports. That's what you meant by national percentage. So you took that, what you see at other airports that are comparable in terms of that mix, projected it out based on the existing runway length, but with the assumption that there would be growth in number of planes based at the airport. Yes. Okay, so that's, that's an annual. Okay, and I just also wanted to address one other item. By the time you get to the airport, pre-flight the aircraft, fly to Madison, deal with ATC, land at Madison, get a cab or a car or whatever, it's a lot quicker to drive over there. The only reason anyone would fly there is for the experience of flying. I had, a, I had another follow-up question based on these forecasts. Thank you for <laughs> clarifying that. Because I was really curious when I heard that. You know, that was kind of an interesting anecdote. But you but got that from your, from your son's yep, yep, friend? Yep, it's secondhand. It's secondhand, yeah. So, I, I, I mean, it's, I, I just was curious about it. Um, I want to get back to what Mr. Drazen asked about. These forecasts are based on existing runway and the existing airport so what you're saying is that if there were an expansion we could expect more than this I'm or are you just saying this is going to be the this is going to be the trends whether we have a different runway or not sure so for the because uh, I'm a little bit confused about that Sure. For the total aircraft count, and Greg can comment on this as well if you'd like, but uh, for the total aircraft count, that is based on just hangars becoming available, or at least the ability to accommodate aircraft that want to be here. So as that number climbs up to, uh, it's just over 62,000 towards the end of the 20-year planning period. And so hypothetically, what would happen if there was an extended runway is that the percentage would change in the number of jet operations. So instead of this, as we see, that could increase as a total percentage. And then also there would probably be a small increase to the total operations, but not as much. Because in a, a small plane, a lot of the planes that are flying right now, they don't care if it's a 4,000 foot runway or a 19,000 foot runway, they need <coughs> less than that anyway. So, for the, so the short answer is for smaller planes, probably wouldn't change much. For the larger planes, there'd probably be a, a smaller uptick. Could you provide us, will the master plan provide an estimate based on, again, the experience at other airports in the country, if, if adding 500 feet or 1,000 feet, you know, what number of aircraft based, again, on, on it's, it's hard, every, every community is unique, but would there be sort of an educated guess? Sure, for the facility requirements, something that we're looking at doing, so the facility requirements is the next chapter of the master plan. What that would do is look at other airports with longer runway links, 4,500, 5,000, so on, and see what the fleet mix is there, and use that to get a better idea of how that would change. Thank you. Hey, any other questions from the committee? Hearing none, we'll open it up to the public. It is now quarter to nine. We'll close it at nine o'clock. Does the public have any questions relative to forecast summary, the forecast summary? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next steps in the schedule. Okay, yeah, and that really um, kind of brings us to the end of our what we're presenting tonight. Um, we did want to, I guess, again, reiterate that we are still, um, no decision has been made about what facilities are going to be um, recommended. Uh, all options are on the table. As Rob uh, alluded to, our next step is to really get into what I would call the meat and potatoes of the master plan. We're going to be looking at runway length. We're going to be looking at needed hangers. Um, and so that next chapter we plan to roll out um, in short order, and we'd like to give you folks a couple weeks to look at that. Uh, and the plan is to meet again in July. And, and then we're really going to be looking at you know, these, these runway length questions. Um, Again, the intent of this master plan is to really stay within that des existing design group of aircraft, the B-2 design. Um, and again, the, the focus points, and, and this is you know from the scope at the beginning, we're looking at that primary runway length. We're looking at what can be done with the crosswind, uh, either in terms of paving or reorient 
ending that runway to maybe share in some of that traffic uh, and take some of that traffic a different direction. Uh, we're going to be looking at hangars and how we can um, accommodate hangars and what, what requirements for land would be needed. Um, and, and then aprons was an, another consideration. And, yeah, and, and apron really is that, that area uh, really intended for uh, the, the parking and staging of aircraft, like say in and around a terminal area, uh, more, more community use. Um, the, we do have a, a map of the airport, Mac, Mark, maybe that's what you were trying to pull up here. No, I was actually oh. just trying to point to the <laughs> Yeah, and then maybe it's in one of the, the next slides here, but um, anyway, that, those are our next steps. Um, and I think that was really what we just wanted to, to lay is our, our next step is to look at the runway length, look at hangars. Um, that'll be our next chapter. Uh, we want to get that out to you folks to, to review. Great. Any, any committee member have any questions? Yep, I, I see here, but I want to make sure the committee is, Just a is quick addressed question. first. I'm, I want to make sure I understand what Greg's saying. So we're going to get that those two chapters in two weeks, or we're going to get them a few weeks before the next meeting? I, I, I'm sorry, I just... Yeah, the intent would be to have at least, you know, two weeks for you folks to review it in advance before of the next meeting. The next meeting. Right. Okay. Yep. And have we set a meeting date for July yet? Has that been set? Yeah, I think that would be one of the, the next action items here. What we're doing right now? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't I didn't look at the agenda. Okay. Um so we should set a meeting date. Um, when you're looking at other airports with expanded or larger runways than Mori has right now, are you also going to be providing data about the sort of safety features that those airports have? Um, I know that some of the concern about a possible expansion of the airport is the, um, the EMTs and the fire departments of Cross Plain and Middleton are all volunteer based. And with a larger expansion of an airport with more jets coming, with higher traffic, volume, um, we want to know if those safety concerns are being addressed by Mead and Hunt as well in their analytical data. Sure. Um, I guess the way I would answer that is, you know, the airport is designed as a, as a B2 facility now, and we've heard from the city and others that there's no desire to advance beyond that. So the exercise that we want to go through in looking at similar airports or airports that are slightly larger is where is that tipping point in terms of runway length and facilities where we would start seeing aircraft larger than B2 accommodated? And so it, we, and then we want to stay within that for sure. Um, and, and we just thought that would be a helpful exercise knowing that if we are talking about additional runway length, at what point um, is that really going to make a, a larger aircraft more easily accessible here? And, and it's hard to quantify that, but we thought by looking at all these other airports that are slightly larger, that that might be an interesting exercise and give maybe the commission some assurance that if we went to this kind of runway length, we're going to be staying in this kind of classification of, of aircraft. Does it? Are the safety facilities in those airports going to be data? It, you know, and, and for each different class category of, of airport, there are different safety area requirements, um, setbacks, um, runway protection zones, and, and I guess what we're saying is we want to keep all those same standards for this facility. So we wouldn't be talking about larger runway safety areas. We wouldn't be talking about the need for run, higher runway protection zones. We want to stay the same classification of airport. But could you also address, though, in your report, um, the fire, firefighting capabilities of both the Middleton, Springfield, whatever, um, their abilities in case there is an accident of some kind, can they handle it? I mean, I think that's something we could would look at, um, I, I guess, but, it, um, Whether yeah. or not there's capability within the community or communities, in case there was an accident, uh, what would the response be? Would they depend upon Madison? Uh, how would they handle a major accident like that? It could be or could not be fire, but there might be something else. On the airfield itself? Yeah, most or accidents it, happen yeah, within, yeah, within, uh, within proximity. Uh, one to five miles of an airport. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of what 
what would be different from what's you know there now but i mean we could certainly take a look at well it could be foam emergency or else they use to uh, fight the aircraft access for ambulances availability of them uh is there can you include those safety concerns in an assessment of whether middleton springfield could handle any major catastrophe that might come from an aircraft Aside from bombing. Just for the record, we use the city of Middleton. We're part of their fire district. We don't have any of our own. We have a firehouse, but it's not it's really manned. Yeah. yeah, we're part of the Middleton Fire district. City of Middleton Fire District. Right. I guess I'd like to acknowledge the crest request and uh, look into it, but I'm not totally sure what uh, what we'd be looking at. I guess, and we'd have to investigate that. But what I will do, Bob, is I will ask our fire department okay, to good. comment on their ability to respond to various scenarios in the city. Good. We obviously have 10 story buildings that they have to respond to as well. So I, they're, they're very well equipped and uh, we'll get a response to you. Except an aircraft fire might be I, quite different. I understand, understand. Okay. So we should set a time to meet in July. Mr. Chairman, I just went and checked the meeting room availability and uh, the Thursdays in July, the 11th, uh, obviously we're not going to meet on the 4th. The 11th and 18th and 25th are all available. Okay. If you want to stick with the Thursday, it seems to be working. It seems to work. Everybody's here. Oh, just about. Um, is there a preference committee? It would make sense to get meet and hunt some time to get everything to us. Wouldn't the 18th be a... 18th? Been suggested? And I'm glad, Rich, you said that because I just realized we scheduled an airport commission meeting for the 11th. So thank you for suggesting the 18th. Okay, I see no objection. Uh, let's schedule it for the 18th. Uh, it'll be here again, 5.30, Mark. What is uh, 18th? Is that the third Thursday? Yes. It is. That doesn't work for me, I have fire commission. Okay. Speaking of fire attack. Yeah, you can ask well, I can ask you a question. <laughs> That's at six. Is there a problem with the twenty fifth for yeah, anybody? That's would the twenty fifth work? I, I couldn't attend on the twenty fifth. Yeah, that's <coughs> EAA Air sure. Venture. My father's the, in town. The air show. The coast. So All right. So we have the either the twenty fifth or the eighteenth. work something out we'll see how the workload so for uh, Dan uh, as I mean we could always do if the room is available a different day of the night I don't know if that works. <coughs> another idea would be to switch the airport commission to the 18th since Dan doesn't serve on that um, but I would have to check with the airport commission members and unfortunately the chairman just left uh, of the of that group of that body, but um, we'll we'll Why figure don't you it out. Why look into it, Mark, yeah. and then yeah. let us know. Yep. Yeah. Seems like both the 18th or the 25th was uh, workable for for the majority. What what if the 11th were on the table? Would that how would everybody feel about the 11th? <clears throat> that yeah. works. That works for me. Okay. Thank you. Take a look at it and let us know. Okay. Okay. Alrighty, um, we can either open it to public comment for next steps in scheduling, or we can just open it to the public for general questions at this time. Does the public have any questions? Let's just leave it at that about what we've discussed this evening. I've got an announcement if there are no further okay, questions. If there's no further questions, Rich, go ahead and make the announcement. Okay, the uh, uh, Chapter 93 of the Experimental Aircraft Association, which is based at uh, Middleton Municipal Airport, Maury Field, is running our annual fly-in uh, breakfast. That's going to be July 7th. It starts at 7.30, runs through about noon. Uh, it is a fundraiser for the uh, uh, scholarship program for young people and uh, we currently have a, a uh, actually the EA chapter is currently sponsoring two uh, high school students uh, to the tune of $10,000 a piece uh, on their flying 
uh, as well as they do offer uh, scholarships towards uh, aviation careers. So anyone who's interested, please come out. Feel free to join us. There will be uh, fire trucks there. There will be EMS. There will be really good pancakes and a lot of fun. And I don't have to fly in, right? You can drive it. Okay. Most, most people do. It has attracted about 1,000 people annually for the yeah. last several years. It's an absolutely marvelous event. So it's a Sunday, is that right? It is a Sunday. OK. Yeah. All right. Um, I was also asked by Mead and Hunt staff to, uh, if anybody wishes to who is still here and hasn't done so, if you'd like to sign in to make sure that we can um, make sure you're on our email distribution list for these meetings. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the hallway. Thank you. I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So, second. Second. Hearing no uh, objections, we're adjourned. <laughs>